Hi, good evening. I want to call the school committee meeting to order. Um, we picked a much better location tonight. So thank you all for bearing with us at the last meeting. Obviously, we were not well prepared to um, have a meeting where you could hear us as well as us hear you, um, but we did hear everything you said last meeting. Um, it's shaped a lot of what you're going to hear tonight. We're trying to answer a lot of questions tonight. Uh, we took the time to organize it into a PowerPoint presentation, which other than slide one, I think you'll be able to see it pretty clearly. Yeah. Um, but uh, a, a colleague of mine reminded me that since we do this all the time, uh, we lose sight of the fact that no one else understands anything about how these meetings work. Um, and, and I'm the worst at remembering because I've done public service for years and I enjoy it. But I forget when you come to the meetings, you may have not have any idea of how meetings run or when it's appropriate to participate and things like that. So I just sort of wanted to run through um, the agenda. So we'll have some basic things. You know, we'll approve the minutes from the last meeting. That means we can put them online. Uh, we have a various couple of reports to go through. We always put citizens' comments toward the front. Uh, if anyone has a comment about something that is not going to be on the agenda, we want to make sure they have a moment to tell us, hey, can you look at you know, the new recipe for the chicken nuggets? The kids hate them, or you know, whatever it is. Um, and then at item six, we'll dive into sort of some budget talk. Uh, mostly, we're going to be trying to answer a lot of the questions we heard at the last meeting. Um, and just as sort of a reminder, we've been doing budget talk as a committee and as a budget subcommittee um, probably since last August or September. Every two weeks at our official meetings, uh, at least once or twice a month as a budget subcommittee. Um, so there's been a lot of meetings that lead up to this. And again, this is one of our standard normal meetings where we're reporting out information and possibly making motions to move some official business forward. Um, some of the things we'll touch on in the budget uh, that we heard last meeting were class sizes at Green Meadow, uh, the proposed change to Title I, changes in the specials at Green Meadow, the Maynard High School schedule changes, um, and then you'll see another section for citizens' comments. Um, so at the end of the budget talk tonight, this committee really needs to start moving some motions forward. We need to let the administration know you know, what is our direction, what, is, what are we hearing from the community, and where can we balance our needs with our limited funding. Um, so there'll be some motions made, but before we do that, we want to give the public a chance to weigh in. So we'll have an, a public comment section after the budget presentation, <clears throat> and then we'll close that down, and then we'll have official deliberations where we don't take questions, um, and that's just so that we can, um, you know, have a good discussion, and you're all um, party of that. You can, you know, sit and watch. It's not a, it's not a private uh, moment by any means, but it is a time for us to talk uninterrupted and try to come to some decisions based on everything we've heard. Um, so I think that's sort of a description of what we do here. We're really glad to see people. Um, I think we say at every meeting, but this is actually a sincere comment. We really love it because we don't want to make decisions in a vacuum. Um, this is not the toughest year I've ever seen in Maynard, um, but there are changes to make and there are decisions to make. Uh, and I know that this committee puts the students first. Uh, we certainly are concerned about staff as well. Um, and then parents, and I'm a parent, so I know how that feels, but it's students, staff, parents, in my personal opinion, as one person. So that's sort of some of our thinking. I'm gonna walk you through a, um, I won't say short, but it's hopefully comprehensive enough uh, to answer some of the questions that we heard at the last meeting and some things that are sort of hanging around from the budget process uh, all year. So um, at this point, I guess I'll start with uh, taking a motion to approve the minutes from the last meeting. We have a motion to approve the minutes of the April 28th meeting. So uh, second. Discussion? And all in favor? So that's 5-0, the minutes are passed. Uh, chairman's report, I'll be very brief. Um, between last meeting and this meeting, I've spent a lot of time meeting with parents individually, um, as well as in a couple of groups that made sense. Um, and it's been a really great process for me to really uh, understand some more needs. A lot of folks aren't comfortable speaking in this setting. I actually am one of them. Um, but, uh, but I had some great meetings. I pretty much have a home office at Emma's in Stowe um, that I had some great conversations folks that are for some things, against some things. Um, so I just really benefited from that. So I just want to thank the parents for taking time uh, to reach out to me, and it was a really great experience. So other than that, I'll, I'll give a more lengthy report at the next meeting of some things I've been doing with Kate Hogan um, and some things she's been bringing up, but nothing that needs to delay us tonight. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Superintendent Girardi for his report. Could I just point out for anyone who didn't see it, there are um, handouts for everything in the back if you haven't seen those on your way in. All right. So right on those two chairs back there. Thank you, Bethan. Dr. Girardi? Sure. I just have a couple of things to report. One is that um, our curriculum director, Jennifer, and I met with LaSalle College, and we're working on the development of another dual enrollment program in, in addition to our Mass Bay program. 
Um, it's a little more unique and it might be something different to offer our families and our, our students. So it's an opportunity, but it's still in the develop developmental stages. And so we'll report back to the school committee when we get more information on that. Um, also, I want to thank Aaron McClosco and the DPW for their repairing of the sidewalk between Green Meadow and Fowler. It is something that I had asked them to do and they did it promptly. Uh, we have such great relationships with the town. I can't thank them enough. So those are the two things I wanted to point out tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, um, uh, one more thing. Sure. I, we, uh, many of us were in attendance at the Maynard Education Foundation celebration. And just a shout out and a thank you to Maynard Education Foundation. I know we're also focused on the budget. We forgot to say about all the wonderful things that our students and educators are doing thanks to Maynard Education Foundation. So I want to make sure I acknowledge that too. That's a great point. So a few of us just came from that uh, over at the Blue Coyote. And uh, one thing I want to follow up on, we heard briefly about uh, the trip to Cuba that the kids just came back from. Um, so if we can just sort of, I would love to see some more information around that. So if you could invite um, the faculty leader um, to sort of prepare something, you know, nothing too formal, but I just think that if people would really love, I mean, it's Cuba. Um, so I think that we'd all love to see that. And then if we could sort of encourage them to reach out to the middle and the uh, elementary school, I think what I like about folks traveling is sort of bringing back the information and then dispersing it to the community um, so we can all benefit. So if we could pass that along, that would be great. Um, so now, uh, student representative report. So Janelle is at the concert at the high school. Uh, so we gave her a pass tonight on her report. Uh, so next would be citizens' comments. So for anything not listed on the agenda tonight. So uh, feel free to step up to the microphone and we just need your first name and your comment. Ma'am, are you coming to comment? No, just chatting. <laughs> um, it's all good. It's an impressive knee <laughs> uh, So moving on, um, so item six is the fiscal year 17 budget. Um, you can't read this slide, it just says fiscal year budget process and priorities. Uh, so I just wanted to sort of start out with our mission. Um, we did a lot of work this year as a community. Uh, we focused a lot on our outward communication and trying to get some input, input from parents and faculty about sort of, you know, who are the Maynard schools and where are we heading? And I could talk an hour just on that topic, but sort of the update at this point is just, this is sort of the mission statement that um, all groups have sort of coalesced around at this point. Um, and it's basically the Maynard Public Schools are committed to a superior academic experience for Maynard students that prepare them to be productive citizens in an interconnected technological world. Uh, you know, I actually think we have an updated version that mentions global citizenry, um, but that's neither here nor there. Um, so sort of this is what drives us a lot of our decision making. Um, and I just am very thankful for all the parents and staff administration for the year we've had um, for sort of coming together and working on a vision and you know more importantly than just a vision statement is just sort of how to put that into action so if any of you have participated in any of those forums you know that there's a lot more that goes into this um, and jennifer Gaudet has uh, really taken this by storm uh, and you know she's drilled it all the way down into pathways in the high school and and she's got lots of really exciting things happening so you might not have known that because we give these updates at these meetings um, and we usually only have a couple folks around um, but we try to do a good job about putting it out on the website and the facebook page so so there's really a lot of exciting things happening and I encourage you to um, so, you know, take a look around and certainly reach out to any of us if you have any questions because it's been a really exciting year in terms of the vision and sort of where we're heading. Um, so tonight, the May 12th school committee meeting, um, you know, we heard a lot of things last meeting um, that helped shape what we'll talk about tonight. So tonight we'll discuss, you know, what does the budget process look like for the school committee? Uh, the updated list of additions and reductions, uh, which looks like this. It goes by many names. I find it, I don't know, I, don't, I have other names for it. Um, we'll be discussing elementary class sizes at Green Meadow and Fowler, uh, because the first two grades at Fowler are certainly still considered elementary. Uh, the proposed Title I changes, the changes to the Green Meadow specials, the Maynard High School schedule, and the teacher student load changes, and I'll finish up with some next steps. Um, so first, I just wanna also just thank everyone here has certainly had a big hand in putting this together tonight. Um, I'm really excited to share the information with you. I know a lot of times we just sort of come to the meetings and we just speak. Uh, we felt this was important enough to sort of put it together in something we could all follow along. Um, so the budget process started, let's see, July 2015. Uh, last summer, we start looking at the process 
uh, at our regular school committee meetings. Um, Pete DiCicco, our business manager, is great at sort of getting on everyone on board um, and sort of laying you know, ahead what we've done in the past and what our concerns are going forward. He's our go-to person for keeping track of the fluctuations in the special education budget, um, which as they fluctuate, they just certainly are a concern. Um, certainly not a judgment, but Pete's great about keeping us on track of our circuit breaker and things like that. So, um, so we start in July, so which means we'll be starting this coming July on the next year's budget. Um, so we're always talking about the budget, I guess is the takeaway. Um, in October, uh, Bob and I met with uh, the, assistant, uh, the assistant town administrator, the town administrator, and the head of the board of selectmen. And the things we talked about were, let's see, Assabet Valley Regional High School, um, that's the vocational school. Um, many of you may or may not know that we pay, right now we're actually paying to rebuild that high school as well. Um, that is more internal piping and heating and things like that. but. Uh, this year, our bond payment is one of the highest it will be over, I think, a 15-year cycle or 20-year cycle. I've lost track. Um, so that's a big hit to the town budget. Um, we always talk about sort of the choice in, choice out students, how many kids are staying in Maynard versus choicing out. Um, always on everyone's radar are the health care costs. Um, OP OPEB is other post-employment benefits. So many of our employees obviously stay with us, you know, till the, till the end of their tenure, and then they, they leave with a... Um, you know, retirement, a pension, and things like that, which I think is a wonderful system, um, but it means we always have to be concerned about paying for those employees after they retire. So uh, Kevin Sweet has done a wonderful job. I think Maynard's actually leading the way in making sure we put money aside every year so as people retire, we don't um, have a ton of unexpected costs. Um, and then we obviously talk about our capital needs. So some of the capital needs we've been talking about in terms of each school, uh, Green Meadow, there's the playground need. I think that's been well documented. It's a very old playground. It's not accessible to our special needs students many times, um, and it floods out all the time. So a little bit of rain and there's no play. Um, so that's that one. Fowler, we just built a new playground over there. They're looking now at the soccer fields over there. There's some irrigation issues, and I know there's a lot of ledge rock right under the fields, so the field is very hard. Um, so we're looking at that as well, is sort of studying if there's anything that can be done at the Fowler fields. Uh, and at the high school, some of the needs that I think previous school committees talked about more than we have, but uh, needs around sort of new stadium seating for the football and soccer games, um, a new field house for the football team. Um, so those are some of the things that we've heard about from the school committees before us and that are on the town's radar in terms of a you know, 10 to 15 year capital plan. So something's happening sooner rather than later and then something's happening uh, along the way. So, so that's sort of what we start talking about in October, getting together with the town and, and opening the dialogue. We also talked about technology. We now have a, a five-year technology plan and a 10-year budget. Um, after a lot of hard work from our staff, our faculty, and our administration getting together and really making a plan for technology, um, I've worked for Maynard for a long time. It's, only, it's one of the only plans I've actually ever seen. Like, it's amazing. Like, I'm so proud that they got that done. So we don't have similar plans in place at the fire department, the police department. Like, this is this is really what we should be doing. We should be planning ahead and not always reacting. So I'm really proud of um, the staff for pulling that together. Uh, we also talk about free cash, which is um, a long story, but at the end of the day, Maynard, uh, like many communities, ends up with a, a bunch of unallocated money, and then we talk about how to spend that. It's one-time money every year, because some years it's negative, hopefully hardly ever. Um, so we talk about ways to invest free cash. Uh, and then we also talked about any other likely impacts on the uh, FY17 budget. In November, the town administrator will send out the budget directive. So it's this letter that arrives, and it basically gives us our guidance when we're developing our budget number of what we should expect to ask for. Uh, and this year, if I can summarize it correctly, it was plan on just being able to fund salary increases. So teachers are all under contract. They are you know, entitled and well-deserved raises. Um, we have lots of contracted professional employees, um, so plan on that. So that's a pretty easy number to figure, and we provide that number. What it means is, though, other than some utility things and the increase in the bus fares, uh, not the bus fare, but the bus contract, there's not a lot of extra money coming in this year. Um, so from that, we, from November to February, we develop our budget presentation to the town, uh, which means more or less the Board of Selectmen and the Finance Committee. We submitted a budget of 4.43%, uh, even though the standard salary increase would have been 3.75, because we always ask for more. It's our job to represent the schools and to say, 
we understand your message, but this is really what we need this year. Um, so, and there's been some years, certainly under Dr. Girardi's leadership, where they have funded over um, the request, you know, the, the sort of budget directive. So, so this year uh, wasn't the year that we got that, so we got the 3.75, um, and that's what leads to the numbers on the tally sheet, and then we, as a committee, uh, with input from everyone, we'll try to work to balance that. Um, so other than that, throughout the year we meet, um, did I lose my pointer? Yeah, I got it. Um, so we meet all the time on all of this, and now we're coming up to April and May where we do our final priorities and decision making. Uh, so this won't be as exciting, but there are copies of this in the back. I just wanted to make it part of the presentation. So it's this sheet just broken down into slides. I'm not going to go through every line. Um, certainly when there's time for questions, if you have a question about something, that would be a great time for it. I'm going to hold all the questions till the end. Um, but if everyone's got a copy of something, just make a note and we'll come back to it after. Um, so this list has not changed much uh, in the past few weeks. There's been a few tweaks here and there as we've been finalizing the Maynard High School schedule based on the classes the students need to take and what we can offer. So I'm just going through more of the same uh, spreadsheet here. Again, um, not much changes in the past few weeks. A lot of this is just contractual compliance. Um, so we have some issues with contractual compliance at the high school and at the Green Meadow. So a lot of the changes you see here are just the result of the administration and the union working together to make sure that as employers we are fulfilling the contractual side of things. You know, unions serve a great purpose. You know, they represent their employees and if there's something that's not going well or not going according to contract, they bring it to our attention and Dr. Girardi uh, leads the way with sort of um, working through those issues with folks. So, um, so anytime you see sort of contract compliance, those are things that we can pull, uh, pull things back into compliance and I have a little bit more on that later. Uh, so when you get down towards the end, there's a few things about suggested reductions and again, not, um, no one here is excited about reductions. We wish we were talking about adding more things but we are where we are. Um, so we'll go through these a little bit later in this uh, decision-making process tonight. Uh, the first thing I wanted to talk about overall coming out of our last meeting was class sizes at Green Meadow. And I hope this is easy to read. Um, so I skipped preschool and kindergarten because to some degree they are what they are. You know, we don't know our preschool and our kindergarten uh, enrollment until it happens. Um, so I can certainly provide those at another meeting if folks are concerned about that. Um, we've maintained low class size and especially in the kindergarten, as it's the kids' first year in schools. And I think we've always all believed in trying to maintain, you know, 17, 18, 19 kids in those classrooms whenever possible. Um, but starting in first grade, I just wanted to sort of show folks the numbers. Uh, so we currently have five sections of, I'm sorry, this year we have four sections of general education and we have one Spanish immersion class. Uh, let's see, our total students, 110, the average, when you average in everything except immersion, I pulled those numbers out because immersion is almost always 24 or 25, so that drags the average up unnecessarily. Uh, but the average in the non-immersion classes uh, this year is 21.2, uh, and then next year it's projected to be 21.5. Second grade, similar, similar slides. We have five sections of general education, one section of immersion, 128 students. Today, this year's average 20.8. Next year, 21.25. And that would be one item on the consideration for later in the discussion is taking us down from five to four sections. And if we do that, that's how we get from 20.8 to 21.5. So, so without a change, um, it's a different number. But with the suggested change that we've been presented, it would be going down to four sections because there's a population drop. So if you can see, we have 104 students this year. Next year, we're projected to have 85. So I just want to make sure I clarified that. And we can certainly address that later if there's any questions. Um, but dropping the one section, the section five, would bring us up to 21.25 average. Third grade, we have five sections of general education, one immersion. Um, that, with no changes, um, there are no proposed changes to third grade. Uh, the average of 19 goes to 20.8. Fourth grade, um, which is the other grade that we talked a lot about, or we heard certainly a lot about at the last 
meeting as well as we've heard from faculty, we've heard from our leadership teams. Um, that's probably where one of our other decision points is tonight. So we currently have five sections of general education under years 15, 16, with a total of 113 students. Um, next year is projected to be 95. And then at the bottom of this slide, since I know there's a consideration about how many sections of general education should we maintain for fourth grade, I put the averages. Uh, some of you may remember at the last meeting, I was doing my math and I realized I had a bad number. Um, so when I redid my math during the meeting, which I love to do, um, I realized the average was actually gonna be 23.75 if we take, a, take it down from five to four. Um, so that's another consideration for the school committee tonight is whether we're comfortable with the 23.75 for fourth grade. Um, and then I just put underneath it, um, if we maintain the five sections of general education, we would bring it down to an average of 19. So that's another decision point that we'll discuss tonight. Uh, one thing that we have been talking about all year, and, and a lot of this really comes from um, its research that's brought to us. Uh, Jennifer Godet has been, been great about flooding us with all her research. She's been a wonderful addition to the team. Um, she's got this great document, and we can certainly make it available on the website if there's interest. It's basically about the importance of class size in regards to student achievement. I think, especially as a parent, I always, my son's class is 25 kids, and I always think, gosh, is that a lot? Is that okay? Um, I think our gut reaction is always that less is better. Um, so this is just a really interesting, it's a two-parter, um, but with my powers of PowerPoint, I, it spreads to two pages. Um, so basically, it's the importance of class size um, and Jennifer can speak to these if there's questions after. Um, the things that really impact student achievement are things like student visible learning, response to intervention, formative teacher evaluations, feedback. I won't list them all. But then you go to you know, sort of the next page where things become less important. And I'll try my fancy laser pointer, which I'm not gonna say is gonna work. Um, really right down towards the middle. So basically out of 25 factors, class size ranks 18th in importance out of student achievement. Now we can still always have the discussion about what's the right class size for Maynard, what's the, you know, I think there's still lots of discussion every year about that. Um, and as the populations fluctuate, we do this every year, not just the, well, the, many of us is our first year on school committee, but I've seen, in, I've sat in as a parent and every year we look at the classes and the fluctuations. Um, so this may seem like groundbreaking new stuff that we're talking about this, but I have seen many school committees wrestle with this over the years. Um, so this one just shows that class size is actually not as important to student achievement as we may think. And again, it's just a, it's just a point of data, so. Um, so Rally, that, that's sort of the discussion on class size for Green Meadow. Again, we'll take questions at the end. There's a few more things, but for this particular slide for Title I, um, I'm gonna turn it over to Mrs. Gaudet, as she will be able to speak to that a little bit more eloquently than I will. Thank you. So this represents um, the three sort of models of Title I. Again, Title I programming, as we've talked about um, in past school committee meetings, is federally funded and mandates certain um, expectations within that program that we would have to fulfill if we want to avail ourselves of that entitlement, br entitlement grant. Currently, under the current model, you can see that um, we have two literacy coaches um, or specialists, one math um, and three um, tutors that work with um, literacy. I'm going to skip over the middle column for a second um, and go directly on to the last column, which is the column that the leadership team, after many meetings with um, the Fowler teacher leaders, the Green Meadow teacher leaders, the Title I team, um, and having a debrief as a leadership team, um, including the Title I team, is recommending. What we were looking for, and we've been talking about this, I think, basically since November, um, we wanted to try and expand the Title I model. Um, we've seen an increase in Title I funds due to the change in the way that they allocate Title I funds from the state, and we were spending this year doing a needs assessment to determine how to spend those funds. Um, so this was our suggestion that we have two literacy coaches or specialists, one in each building, two math coaches or specialists, one in each building. Both of those positions would work both with teachers and with students, um, providing some coaching and modeling for teachers, but then also providing some interventions for students um, who were struggling um, based on assessment. 
We were also hoping to have three paraprofessionals or tutors in both math and literacy to again provide support for students um, within the Title I program and we were looking to expand that program that during the school day program into Fowler, um, which we currently have not had the funds to do. So we'd be looking to support students in grades four and five, um, which we have not been able to do through the Title I program previous. So that is the recommendation that we had had. This was what we um, again, since November, have been sort of talking and thinking about, and then with the budget conversations, we got derailed a bit, um, which brings us to the middle column. And so someone had asked at a previous meeting, well, I thought, you know, there were required elements of Title I, we were going to get the funding, what would it look like if we were to reduce the programming? Um, because not all, in either the current model nor the growth model, are all of those funded out of the Title I budget. Um, in the reduction model, all of those positions would be funded out of the Title I grant funding, which means that we have to explicitly follow those requirements of what um, we are providing. So we would have in that model one shared uh, literacy specialist or coach between Fowler and Green Meadow, one shared math specialist or coach, and then three shared um, paraprofessionals. And I'm sorry, that should be, um, I believe, zero math tutors under the um, reduction model. I have to go back and double check that. Um, all of those would be would be shared within um, or would be paid for out of that Title I budget. So we would be providing the during the school day supports that students would need. Um, we would be providing some degree of professional development um, in regards to after school tutoring, um, but certainly not to the extent that we are are now and certainly not to the extent that we were hoping to do within the growth model. So if that covers everything, I think. Um, if, do you want to just maybe briefly go over sort of um, the Title I? Uh, you know, for a lot of folks, they're not even sure what it means. I know sure. that, that was news, you know, that's something I've had to learn along the way. Sure. Um, and Title I is as complicated as a federal program can get, I think. We are allocated the funding based on our um, students who receive, it used to be based on our free and reduced lunch numbers, essentially it's based on low income uh, percentages, and now they've changed the way they calculate that so that they're essentially including any um, student who lives within the metered lines um, who receives any support, uh, government support or services. Um, and so that's how the funding is allocated to schools based on, on low income percentages. Um, from there, the districts, if they choose to accept this entitlement grant, um, which this year was, I believe, 155,000, um, if they choose to accept that, then they have certain parameters of things that they have to abide by. Um, we have to evaluate all of our students in the subject areas that we're going to be providing support in. Again, due to the low um, numbers previously, the low amount of gr the grant previously that had just been in literacy, we are now able to move that or we're hoping to move that into math. Um, so we need to evaluate all of our students. We need to establish um, a range of, of student scores that we will be providing services for. And then we provide services for those students and track their progress to ensure that they are making sufficient progress with the interventions that we're providing. Um, students can, you know, essentially, opt in or not opt in but be in the title one program because of low scores and then work their way out uh, based on the growth that they've seen and that's certainly the hope of what we have previously um, because again the budget had been um, about eighty thousand um, dollars we had focused our resources solely on literacy and solely at green meadow because we didn't have the funds to expand that to other places with the increase in funds we were hoping to be able to support not only the literacy at green meadow but also the math and also our fourth and fifth grade students here at fowler um, most title one programs tend to go k sort of through fifth grade um, to make sure that you're getting all of the core skills before they enter into the middle school one, quest, one question I had from a parent, and I don't think I had a chance to relay it to you this week, is if it is a grant program, then why is it part of our budget cuts? So what I'm assuming is that part of our operating budget is giving additional funding to that type of support, Correct. you know, regardless of the name. So I was just wondering if you'd touch on that. Yep, so in the um, Title I program model, under the current model, only um, four of those positions are currently funded out of the Title I budget. Um, the other two positions are funded out of our operating budget. So if we were to see a reduction um, in our operating budget, then we would still, if we were going to accept the funds, still need to, to provide support for students, and the way we do that would look different. Gotcha, okay. Um, and I think you're right. I think, so the current model, you know, is column one, the, the services we're providing now. Uh, the reduction model, there should be a zero under the math tutors. I'm sure you're right about that, because I know that's something we've wanted to do, but haven't been able to fund over the years. Um, and then the growth model, uh, just to clarify, is what we would love to do. Um, right. 
So Title I will be another decision point as uh, the school committee works through the list tonight uh, to sort of decide where the funds that we have that are available will be applied. Um, so that's why this slide is on here. Um, so another obviously hot topic um, is the changes to the specials at Green Meadow. Um, I know at first when it was, uh, when the information was out, it was, you know, the idea is that we were actually cutting the programs. Um, and unfortunately, you know, that's, the good news is we're not cutting the programs. Um, the bad news obviously is that we're taking full-time teachers down um, to a 0.8 position for three of them and library would go down to a 0.5. So obviously we have employees that are affected by that decision. I think that everyone on this committee, um, you know, especially myself for the first time pro through the process, realizes sort of this hits home. Um, you know, so these are people that we really like, our kids love them, um, it's a difficult decision. Um, but it's, you know, there's a lot of reasons behind it. Um, there's certainly some contractual obligations that we want to make sure we're maintaining um, to be fair to everybody um, in, you know, in the entire Green Meadow. Um, so the results of these changes that all students will continue to have art, gym, music, and library, um, but instead of five days a week, we would have three and a half days a week, and library would be every other week. Um, we'll also, you know, one result of this and something that we can do without impacting the the budget necessarily, but I think a great addition personally um, as one member of the committee is that the additional time uh, can be used for nature-based science education, uh, additional free play in the schedule. So, you know, when we have the discussions in the beginning of the year, it's more about what would we love to do? You know, would we love to have the kids doing worksheets less and being outside more and also working on their social skills? Um, and this is, a, you know, this is one way we can achieve that uh, while we're dealing with a difficult budget year. Um, so, you know, it's not my job to really sell you on anything. I think there's things we'll all agree and disagree on. Um, but this one, really, the trade-off is a, a little bit less specials and a little bit more science and time outside and more free play. Um, so that's really just my, explain, my explanation of that. Um, the potential next steps in terms of the specials is um, through a lot of the meetings with the parents for students who are in regular education, um, there's been a big desire expressed to me that they would love for their kids to get exposed to Spanish. I know a lot of us at our preschools had that, um, so that's something that we can look at as part of next year's budget process. If we have the resources and the time and the schedule, I know that um, a lot of parents expressed um, that they would like to benefit from the Spanish um, resources we already have at Green Meadow, and next year we'll have them at Fowler. So. That is Green Meadow Specials. Uh, Mrs. Dankner has been kind enough to put uh, some slides together as far as what that would actually look like. Uh, and she's here if we have questions after the presentation as well. Uh, so for kindergarten, this would be what their daily schedule looks like. Uh, so I'll read through the slide. Um, in 2015-16, the expectations were 60 minutes of literacy, 45 minutes of writing, and 60 minutes of math. Starting next year, and this ties into, and Jen can speak to it more, Mrs. Godet, um, we're also inheriting the new science standards, if I'm not incorrect about that. Um, so this ties in with that as well. So we'll now be looking at 60 minutes of literacy, 45 minutes of writing, 60 minutes of math, and the 120 to 150 minutes of science is obviously weekly, because um, I got really confused when I first saw that. Um, <laughs> although somewhat excited as a science-y kind of parent. Um, so this is what their schedule would look like. You know, again, there's copies of the presentation if you really want to look through this. Um, there's some changes, um, but minor in, in some ways as well. So, uh, so those are the changes for a kindergartner. Um, and this is just another summary slide. So 45 minutes of morning meeting has been changed to 30 minutes. Free player choice time has been increased to four to uh, two, 4.5 times per week. Uh, that's in addition to recess. Uh, 45 minutes of math has been expanded to 60 minutes of math. Specials will be 3.5 times per week rather than five. And the transition times around specials, lunch, arrival, dismissal uh, through, uh, throughout the day have been expanded a little bit, buying them a few more minutes. Because if you've ever seen them trying to get the kids from one place to another in a few minutes, it's fun and crazy at the same time for the teachers, I'm sure. Um, so there's a little bit more time in the day for that. Uh, so these are the changes for the first, second, and third grade. Uh, the previous expectations this year were 90 minutes of literacy, 45 minutes of writing, and 60 minutes of math. Next year, 90 minutes of literacy, 45 minutes of writing, 90 minutes of math, and 120 to 150 of science per week. And I'll just go to the summary. Uh, 45, morning, 45 minutes of morning meeting has been reduced to 30 minutes. Recess free play during the day expands from 30 min 35 minutes, a 15 minute recess during the morning or afternoon and 20 at lunch, to 50 
minutes with the addition of another 15 minute period daily. 150 minutes of science are built into the weekly schedule, 60 minutes of math is expanded to 90, specials will be 3.5 times per week rather than five, and again, those transition times, um, we've added a few more minutes here and there. Um, so really, that's all about the impact to the change of the specials, um, other than obviously the personal impacts and the, the folks that we obviously already love having on our staff. Um, we understand and we can't sugarcoat it, so I'm just giving you the facts and we can all you know, have our opinions on that and we can certainly take questions uh, later on that. Uh, the Maynard High School class load rebalancing. Um, this is one that we have been talking about really since last fall. Um, for some of you who may not know and may just have younger children in the system, uh, last October, November, right around there, uh, we had a really popular teacher resign at the high school. And one of the reasons cited during the exit interview process was class load. Class load uh, means how many students you have total. So if you teach three classes or five classes, um, this particular teacher had, I think it was around 130 students sort of that uh, that person was responsible for. Um, and when, when that happened, we couldn't really prevent uh, the person from resigning. I, I don't want to get into anyone's personal stuff. It just, it was a sad situation. The Maynard High School kids did a great tribute video. It was unfortunate on many levels. Um, the outcome of that was another example of sort of the administration and the um, union working and getting together and sort of getting to the bottom of these issues. You know, uh, part of that is just sort of understanding that some teachers had in the low, you know, 60s and some had upper 120, 130. And is there a way to sort of balance that and bring it into some fairness for our staff? So, you know, as much as we may talk about all the great things we'd love to do in the schools and, and worry about the budget, I think that um, we take the fact that we're actually these folks' employers really seriously. We can't always solve every problem, but I think when you see the disparity in those numbers, you know, for me personally, it's a fairness issue. Um, so one of the first um, issues that Mrs. Gaudet inherited was, can you take a look at the high school schedule? We're, <laughs> we're certainly getting a lot of feedback that it's not working in a variety of ways, and we would love to look at that and try to solve that going into next year. Um, so in 2015-16, a lot of folks got together and completed a review of the high school schedule. This included the classes we actually offered, um, the classes with low enrollment, um, things like that. So we found that we had some classes with one or two students. We had some classes with three, four, five students, 10, um, and then you know the upper levels um, that you would expect in a high school. Um, so you know the goal again being the sort of the fair rebalancing of the workload and um, and the preps for the teachers and how many actual classes they were responsible for. Um, so in 2015-16, total number of students per teacher ranged from 54 to 138. Uh, this will improve. This going into next September, uh, more of a range of 81 to 118. Um, but that does not include uh, any full-time equivalent employees uh, in specialized programs. So I don't exactly understand that, but I know it's the <laughs> Jennifer, if you want to help me out with that one. It's been a lot of information. Yeah. So <laughs> the simplest example would be band where there's over 80 90 students, students 90 class. students in yeah. the band, and so that person automatically is going to have an elevated class load. Um, we also have a situation where a teacher, as part of her caseload, is uh, as part of her, her preps, she teaches a VHS class, so that is one of her classes. And so if you count up the number of Maynard High School students she has, it looks as though she only has um, four classes worth of students because her f fifth class is an online class and they are not on our rolls. So um, there's certain cases where it didn't make sense to include them in the analysis. That's right. Thank you. Um, so, you know, we had worked with the union um, to make sure that going forward into 2016-17 that teachers at Maynard High School will only have three prep periods, which I am told is a code word for how many classes they teach, because um, I'm still getting all the lingo down. Um, so basically, any of, the suggest any of the things you see on the tally sheet that say MHS compliance are how we can, con basically the short story is how do we continue to offer the classes that kids need to follow their path, whether it's college or becoming an entrepreneur um, or, or whatever their path is, how do we do that within our budget and within the contract guidelines? And again, I say that in no judgment, it's just that's the world we operate in. It's a very standard educational concept. Um, so I'm really happy with the work that was done this year on that. Obviously, it's, you know, losing teachers is not what we want. Um, I think what the end of the story is you lose full-time teachers and you bring on part-time teachers to teach uh, the classes we need. And if you were here at the last meeting, you had lots of examples from the high school students 
uh, one of them was my babysitter, of the classes she needed to get into the school she's going to next year. And to continue to provide those classes, um, we have to just sort of probably rethink our model a little bit, and this is an example of that. So. Uh, this is a good uh, diagram of what the changes at Maynard High School will look like. So some classes that won't be offered, Farm and Film and Culture, Accounting 2, Portfolio, uh, Spanish 5, there was only one request of a student. On the other column you see, what is our plan? Can we offer that student another option for taking that class? So when you see dual enrollment, uh, it's what Dr. Girardi referred to earlier. We currently have an agreement with Massachusetts Bay, and uh, we actually now, I think, can announced, and I think you did, that we have an agreement with LaSalle College. We're working on it, yeah. It's almost there. Yeah. Um, so this is for students to take the classes through there. Um, do you have a better explanation than I do? I know that they... We've, yeah, we've uh, been doing it with Mass Bay for, we've been having, we've had a dual enrollment program with Mass Bay, and, and some of our teachers have even been professors, They're adjunct professors for Mass Bay. We have, it's amazing, the high school staff, how many qualified to be adjunct professors, which shows you the quality of staff we have at the high school. Um, so students do enroll for those dual enrollment pro courses and we've picked courses that sometimes we haven't had enough staff to run like in the business area or psychology. Mm -hmm. And so um, that's what we've been doing and we want to expand it and we're gotcha. working on expanding it. I think one thing that sort of, um, one highlight I took from this whole worksheet really was that one of the benefits of being in the Maynard schools, because I still love being here and I love the small school system, is that we even with the one, per one child that wanted to take Spanish 5, we didn't just write it off, we actually, you know, the guidance department sits down and says, here's another option for you. And I think that's one of the benefits of the small school system. And you, you always hear the phrase, you know, the phrase, the kids don't fall through the cracks. And these are examples. When I, I knew we would have a worksheet like this, but what I didn't expect was all the work to go into plan for the students to have other options. So I was really impressed by that. Um, and as a parent, I was really thrilled to see that. So there's a list of classes with very low enrollment. Um, you know, you start to see the 10, 12, and 18. Um, I'm sure those will be, you know, things that we talk about, but you sort of had to draw a line and, and balance things out. So in terms of teachers and preps and the budget, um, you know, those I'm sure were some of the harder decisions around history of sports, um, exploring computer science and things like that. Uh, but again, they are showing some other options. So uh, the average class size at the high school, although this didn't necessarily come up at the last meeting, it was a natural um, piece of data since we've been looking at it so much this year. Um, so in 15-16, 18.23 at the high school. Uh, it's gonna stay relatively stable at 18-12. Uh, number of classes by size, uh, not including grade eight or grade nine quarter classes. Um, so this gives you number of classes below 10 students was 15 last year, this current year. Next year it'll be four. Um, and you can follow, I won't redo the whole slide. Um, but you can kind of see sort of what's been going on and sort of the rebalancing and, uh, and I think, to be honest, I think that this is a great example of sort of the fairness principle being applied. Although not difficult, I mean these decisions are never fun. Um, but there's definitely been some fairness applied this year. Um, so just to sort of wrap things up and then open it up for your questions. Um, so the next steps for us tonight, uh, the school committee needs to prioritize either the reductions or the, the programs or the, the class sizes we want to instruct Dr. Girardi to um, prioritize as he and we finalize all the budget numbers heading into town meeting on Monday night. Uh, so this is just a reminder that on the 16th, which is Monday, uh, 7 p.m. town meeting right here. Um, so anyone who's available, come out and listen. And usually there's only about 75 people there making decisions for all of us. So I always encourage more people to come out because you just never know what will happen at town meeting. I've seen people removed by force. It's really, it's really something. Um, but, but that's very rare. Um, uh, we had also talked about at the last meeting, we had a number of parents asking um, about Spanish immersion, the cost of the program, and things like that. We did not put that on the schedule tonight because I made the decision, so you can blame me, um, that we wanted to focus on things tonight that actually affect people's jobs, whereas Spanish immersion is a great topic and we'll get all the information out. I had never known that the information was hard to get, um, but as soon as you tell me that, and this school committee that, you're gonna get the information. Um, so we plan to present everything we have on Spanish immersion on the 26th, and we encourage you to return for that meeting as well. Um, but tonight, really, our focus was letting folks know, employees know, your job is safe, your job is not safe. It's not fun, but I think it's a, it's a fair thing to be telling people at this stage of the game. A um, little preview into next year, since it'll be starting in July. Um, things that I personally and the school committee has uh, would like to see for next year is just sort of a full review of staffing. Um, this isn't news, we, all, we really do this almost every year. Um, but just 
we've been examining a ton of data, comparison data with other communities our size, other si our size by number of students and socioeconomically. Um, and we've seen some really interesting numbers around total staff, total number of paraprofessionals, um, enough so that we think it warrants, inve you know, investigation is not the right word, but certainly a review next year. So um, teachers, paras, administrative costs, all those things, um, you know, to represent you well as a school committee, we need to always be looking at those things. So that's an eye into next year. Um, if you haven't heard, our director of pupil services is moving uh, on to another position in another community, uh, and we will all miss her deeply. Um, when that new person comes on, uh, we would like that person to also just own the program, conduct a review, and give us their assessment as well. I think that's a natural anytime someone comes in. Um, you know, we'll be having a new principal at Fowler next year. I would assume we would have similar assessments. Um, we just need good data to work with, all of us. Um, and then lastly, um, I've had some parents emailing, um, again, people aren't always comfortable to get up and say something that could be controversial. You know, when we look at making cuts next year, you know, do we look at football, do we look at band and WAVM and how many buses we provide and all the host of extracurricular activities. So I think in fairness to folks who ask those questions that it's on us to at least make sure the review is conducted. Um, and I'm not saying anything will come of it, but I think that's our, that's our job. That's what we do for you um, as your volunteers. Um, and our, we rely a lot on the administration to help us with that, but they give us great information and then we have our meetings that we hope folks come to and, uh, and we start working through these uh, decisions. And this happens every year. This is kind of the process. Um, I'm very used to it now, but I recognize that this isn't as much fun for everyone else. I'm just sort of a public service junkie, I guess. So um, I think that's it. And thank you. I really mean it. Thank you, everyone. Um, so what I'll do is I'll take my seat again, and then we will take questions. Um, same format as always. Just come up to the microphone, your first name, um, and we'd love to hear from you before we begin our deliberations. So thank you. Hello, I'm back. <laughs> um, my name's Ann Stackowitz, and I have a question, uh, well, it's a two-part question. Um, I know on the table is getting rid of one of the Fowler guidance counselors. Um, I have a son in fifth grade, he's on a 504 plan, and I spend a lot of time speaking with his current counselor, and I know she's one of the ones who was told she'd be let go. Is the proposal, does that mean that there will be one counselor for all four grades, so it will be doubling her workload? So Is the, that correct? Yeah, right now we actually have two counselors and one um, student adjustment counselor, so it's reducing from three service professionals down uh -huh. to two. So okay. it's more of a third than a half. Okay, so it will be, so, so that one and a half will be taking the full load. So the school adjustment counselor is not a, a guidance counselor. It's not a guidance counselor. Right. So is a school adjustment counselor trained how to do 504s and yes. that type of thing? Yes. Okay. I don't, yes. Is that at Green are Meadow? You, I, at Green Meadow, I just got a report. We actually met with the guidance counselors today to review this, to talk about what they do. I know at Green Meadow, the student adjustment counselor does the 504 plans there. So okay. it is possible for a, a student adjustment counselor to do that. Okay. So um, given the number of children who have issues, um, and given I am aware that the incoming fourth grade class has a number of children who have needs, is your, do you envision the, the, the proposed counselors being able to handle that amount of children that need help? Well, we talked about similar school studies, and similar uh -huh. schools do have less counselors than we do. So, okay. yes. It's, so, it's going to be hard because, of course, you know, it's nice when you can enjoy additional staff over what other people have. But right. it is not uncommon for that, that level of staffing for the school. Okay. And um, I guess seeing that there is a proposed adding a guidance counselor to Green Meadow. Yep. So I don't see how that sort of reconciles. Taking one away from here, adding one there, there. That the adding was in kind of a wish list that isn't even being considered tonight and was kind of off the table as soon as we did get, didn't get any additional funding. So even though those are there, that's kind of like the wish list of things we would like to do. Okay. Which is why the school committee asked for more money. 
Okay. And so it's not even. So that's not the definitely additional staff happening. requests are not even a consideration at this point because we didn't get additional funding. But it's important okay. for people to know that we were advocating for those things. Okay. Okay. I, uh, at some point, we could have pulled them off the list, but I think to some degree, yeah. you want a comprehensive, a comprehensive list, especially as we go into next year. Um, so yeah, you could certainly make the argument that some of the items on the middle of this could be removed for clarity. Uh -huh. um, so it's clarity versus a comprehensive list. But yeah, okay. definitely, you know, we work with all three schools, and we say, what you know, you put money aside. That's not your job. That's our job. What do you need here? Um, and that's where some of those come from. Okay. I think it's also fair from transparency to, to show what our vision actually is mm -hmm. if we had the money available. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's a best case scenario. And Having someone in at Green Meadow, an additional. Absolutely. The yeah. additional staff requests, that's Dr. Girardi and Jen and the leadership team sitting down in a room and saying, if we had the funding, what are some things that we could do bigger and better for our kids? Mm -hmm. So as a school committee member, I actually like to leave that on there so that when people come to this meeting, it's not just a list of what are we cutting, it's a list of if the situation was reversed, <laughs> look at all the things that we have the vision that we would like to do. So it would have been, we wouldn't be cutting this, and in addition, we'd be adding this. Correct. Okay. Okay. Just as a parent, I have some significant concerns about that at one. Fowler. Four classes, four grades, and some really intense behavioral grades. So thank you. I'm very concerned. Thank you, Ann. Hi, my name is Lydia. Um, I have a daughter at Green Meadow in first grade. <clears throat> um, I have a couple of comments or just observations sure. and then a question. Um, and the observations are more about discrepancies between what our mission or what it seems to be a mission and, and what is actually happening. And the first one, um, if we're cutting library, back to point five. That's where kids first get their start in learning technology. And if part of our mission is to try to make them more technologically savvy, we're reducing their hands-on time with computers and learning it at an earlier age. And that's just an observation. My second observation is that we have all of this money and um, resources devoted to a Spanish immersion program, but then the Spanish AP class is being eliminated. And I understand that's because there was only one student who requested that. But what, going forward, is there a plan or consideration? Because when those students get to that point, they are going to need a Spanish AP teacher. So is, is that being looked into and is that in consideration or is that something we're going to worry about, you know, five, six, however many years from now. Um, and the other thing too is in reducing class sizes, it may not be immediately detrimental, but with the widening of Route 2 and with the increase of multifamily housing units in Maynard, we're just going to get more families and we're going to get more kids. And with an influx, that means the classroom sizes are just going to go up. And if we reduce down to four, at least in like first and second, and then I assume next year third grade is going to get reduced to four, and then fifth grade or whatever, if that trend keeps continuing and then we start getting an influx of students, because people, once the Route 2 corridor is finished and people are able to commute a lot faster, People are going to be moving out from Arlington. They're going to be moving out from, you know, in town because it's going to be easier. Um, you're not going to be sitting in traffic for an hour and 40 minutes like you used to each way. Um, and then my question is, if the town next week when you guys present to them, I'm assuming that you're still going to plug to try and get additional funding if they have any free monies that are available. If you are given any additional funding, will that definitely go to um, preventing the staff and program reductions? Like, is that a guarantee, or is it a possibility that it could get siphoned off into something else, like, that's on the wish list? Like, are, are the reductions the priority before the wish list? A, there's a lot in there. I know. <laughs> I had a lot of I questions. Know. I'm trying to take notes. 
Um, I, I guess I can respond to, I'll try to respond to, th to three other things that you raised. With regards to language, one of the things that we looked at on curriculum subcommittee this year was our long-term language program. It's something that Jennifer and Bob have been thinking about. Um, and so right now we're offering Latin and we talked about what to do with the Latin program. Would we continue to offer Latin um, in sixth grade? And currently we've offered Spanish in eighth grade, or sorry, Spanish from seventh grade on, but French became an option in eighth grade. So as a result, our French numbers have been lower, Spanish has been higher, um, and so we, we had a, a ton of discussion this year about what's our long-term vision for language. What we ultimately decided at the end of the year, after hearing from a number of parents who love the sixth grade Latin program, um, and love the sixth grade Latin teacher, I should say, too, um, we've decided to push that conversation to this coming year because with the Spanish immersion kids moving up, we really need to think about what we're gonna do for language so when they get to the high school, what do we want to be able to offer them if they choose, you know, want to pursue an additional language? Um, and also for just people in the, in the district, we want to hear from parents. So if we're to offer, for example, um, a third language, do we want to continue with French, Spanish, and something else? Might we want to become just a two language? You know, just keep two languages, but maybe switch what they are. Um, but we're going to be looking for more input on that. So I think with regards to AP Spanish, we don't know yet. I don't think we can answer that. I think what, what you're seeing right now is that the interest just isn't there and to run a class for one student just isn't viable. Um, or three, sorry, three. Um, the other thing with the number of families coming in, so part of the way that schools are funded, we get money from the state through our foundation budget, our chapter 70 funding, and that depends on our numbers year to year. So that, the, the money, the state funding changes, it's in flux. But we also, as a district, will we'll look at it. So it's not, we might have to cut a class one year, but then the next grade might be higher and you add it back in. Um, so nothing set in stone there. Um, and there was one other thing I wanted to respond to, but I'm sorry. Oh, and with regards to the, the, what you asked about the reductions in staffing, so many of those have to do with um, us complying with the contract. That it's not, even if we got more money from the town, some of those concerns that have been raised this year by staff within the school system, those reductions stemmed from, from those concerns. And from us, for example, with the high school schedule, trying to be more fair with the load. So I'm, I, you know, I don't want to speak for, for Bob and for Jennifer, but. Can I? But, mm -hmm. No, go ahead. Well, why don't you finish that I was thought? Just gonna no, say, I have one on class size I want to share with you. Okay, yeah. but for those who um, reductions that aren't due to contractual obligations mm -hmm. and, and necessity, um, are they guaranteed if you are given additional monies? Are are they guaranteed to you know say you, you mean the class the class size reductions? Class really? size or even the specials, like would library say not get reduced to point five? Could we just put it to point eight, like the other specials, or, or not eliminate the specials. Yeah, the specials reduction also stemmed from um, concerns that were raised by staff at Green Meadow with regards to, contra there, I, I can't go into details, issue. but contractual issues. Okay. Um, so, and the, the library reduction is part of the solution to the concerns that were raised, if that. If so that I would sense. add, though, that any decisions would come back to the school committee, so if if the town warrant process is such, it's not likely, and I'll let you correct me, Dawn, because you were on the Board of Selectmen, right now, the number that we shared with you is the number that's written on a warrant. Unless something changed drastically and the town decided to change all the numbers and change all the warrant articles, that's not likely to change. It could, there's a process, but it's not likely to. Um, so that's why we're trying to balance the budget with what we've been told. But if there are any avenues where we do find, oh, there's extra money here, it always comes back to the school committee and we say, school committee, what's, your pri you know, what's the priority of you in the community? Mm -hmm. Is it library? Because we all value library. You know, believe me, I, I've been pushing for technology in this district, and I know how wonderful our librarian is. Mm -hmm. So that would certainly come up. But there are some things that are contractual. So we also have to advise the school committee, these are contractual issues and we're trying to work them out. And we're still, you know, we're still working on them. Uh, and and trying to figure out how to get a schedule that works for everybody. We, 
you know, Dawn went into really in depth how much work went into it, and I do believe it'll be fairer in the long run, and people will be happy. It's just it's the pe you know it's just difficult because mm -hmm. of change. So, oh, do you um, have another question on that, or do you, I was going to do the class size? Oh, okay. Asma. So on the class size, it sounded like um, you had the impression that every year we just keep cutting back, and so one example we talked about at the last meeting was in the beginning when I was here in Maynard five years ago. There was a class, we usually had small numbers. First of all, we're a victim of our success. You're, you're talking about the Route 2 corridor. It's happening already. You know, our numbers have been growing. That's that, because people are saying, Maynard has great schools, right? So, but when I got here, we typically had five sections in each grade level. And then I remember there was this one grade that was really big. So we had a sixth section. Sixth section mm -hmm. And that teacher was the first grade teacher one year but then the next year, we didn't need six sections in first grade because the next class underneath was around 90-something, and that was a big class at 118, 120. So that teacher became the second grade teacher. That teacher kind of went up with the kids. <coughs> so every year that I've been here, the school committee diligently looks at the numbers. Now, because we're a victim of our success, in the past, our numbers were in the high teens, low 20s. Mm -hmm. Now they're in the low 20s, mid 20s. That's the change that has occurred because every year the school committee is faced with balancing the budget, trying to be fair, trying to be even. So it's not like we've been reducing. We're a victim of our success that we are, what you're predicting has already happened. Mm -hmm. We've had a lot of kids choosing in. The school committee had a really big debate about choice at the last meeting. Um, and more, more people are gonna move in, that's a reality. Um, but we haven't been reducing a lot, I guess is the, is the hard way to explain it. Or the easy, you know, it's not like we're reducing from six down to five, down to four. That hasn't happened at all. If, if anything, when I started here, most of the classes were five sections, and there was always one or two that might have been six. Now, many of our classes, our sections, elementary sections, have six sections, and there's a couple that have five, so that everybody kind of has a low 20 number. Now, we did notice, though, that fourth grade is going to have a high 20 number. When Dawn was doing her numbers, she noticed that, so the school committee is probably going to address that. But I just don't want you to think that we're actually reducing a lot. We're not. We're just looking to be balanced and fair. Okay. All right. It just, because my daughter's in first grade, when she was in kindergarten, you know, all of them were six. There yeah. were six classes per yeah. grade. And then she went into first, and her class was the only one that went to five. Yeah. And now they're talking about reducing, or you guys are saying that second grade will get reduced, and third is going into fourth, and fourth is being reduced. And so it just... It seemed like a trend was starting, and that is a concern. So that's what a lot of people are saying, but we weren't talking about reducing fourth grade. We were talking about second grade, because if first grade had five staff and second grade had six, then it kind of made sense if you have the same number and you have those low 20 class sizes. Mm -hmm. If you don't need that sixth person in second grade, where else could you use it? And the school committee can make a decision tonight. Where is a good place to use that sixth person? Is it in second grade? Is it in first grade? Is it in fourth grade, which we look at these numbers, it's pretty clear. We, you know, we learned from the parents that fourth grade is going to be a big number. So maybe that's the place to use it. Also, a very trying class. So, <laughs> well, children are children. That's what yeah, I. Yeah. No, but these guys are these are feisty. Yeah. Um, Lydia, Lydia, could what? I jump in for one more second? Yeah. Just to say, so my, I, I don't know, is your daughter in the regular class or yes. she? Yeah. Yes. So my son is as well, and so it's. It's something I don't take lightly, particularly because I'm an educator, and regardless of what, I, I love that we have the data on class size. As a teacher, I believe in smaller class sizes, mm -hmm. and I'd love to support that, and I think it's a, this, these are hard decisions, but I also think we as a committee have talked about if parents come together and are telling us, listen, smaller class sizes are really important to us, we can prioritize that for the next budgeting year and see what we can do to address it. Right. It's just at this late, late date, this yeah. year with the numbers that we have, you know, I don't want my son to have larger classes either, and yet if I make the, if we end up making that decision, I understand where it comes from. Mm -hmm. I, don't, I don't, but I hear what, I definitely want you to know we hear what you're saying. Okay, thank yep. you. And that's a really great point. I, I definitely should have included that on the next steps for next year, because we had been talking about that. Um, do we want to be a school district that <coughs> adds one teacher to every class at the elementary level, and what would that number look like? If it's $300,000, and I'm just throwing that out there for the discussion, not just to make my point, 
you know, what do we trade for that? Or what do we try to, you know, market to the town folk and say, you know, we may need an override this year. Now, I mean, I'm not trying to throw everything at you at once, um, but we did talk about looking at that. And, and if that's what we want to be as a community, how do we get there? Um, so I'll certainly update my sort of next steps to include that. Um, so I had forgotten that. So thank you for bringing that up. And I would also say just, I, um, I do think that we should, it should be a conversation with the community about what other, all, look at all the strategies, because I wouldn't even know. I'm not an educator, and just starting to look into it, the research that they put up where class size was actually, I mean, I know it's just numbers, and it's not looking at individual communities and their needs and individual classes. So just understand that I totally get that that's the case, and I myself have this kind of inherent thought of class, smaller class size is better as well. But looking at the research, that is a meta-analysis of a meta-analysis, which means it took like studies that had a bunch of studies and is able, there's a way that they're able to then make them, instead of being apples to oranges, they compare them apples to apples. And they can look at how big the impact was for different types of things that you can do in the classroom. And so they can compare them. So they took studies that had clumped different research together and they clumped all those together and he keeps doing it and he keeps updating and if you go to his website there's more and more so I just think given the visioning we've been talking about and everything I, I also have no problem if we decide that class size is a thing and we have to try to then figure out how we fund that but um, <coughs> look at other things too because you don't know what the possibilities are and and the impact that they could have until we take a look at it together and, and understand it more so I would just say that would be a great conversation to have next year I'm Meg Sullivan, I'm a teacher at Fowler. Um, I teach seventh grade and I really want to comment on the guidance model that we have at Fowler because I think it really works. Uh, we have two guidance counselors and they alternate between years. So we have kids who come in from Green Meadow and they have a guidance counselor who knows them and follows them until they leave Fowler. And as the seventh grade teacher, where I know no one's name when they come in, but they have been in the school, it is really beneficial to have someone who comes to our team meetings and can give us input about a student. If we're like, hmm, the student just doesn't seem to be you know, coming out of their <laughs> shell, and they might say, you know, um, they will. If there's somebody who can just say they will, then we're like, oh, okay, and then we know how to work with that student. Um, and reducing guidance to just one person, I'm concerned that we're not gonna have a guidance counselor who comes to our team meetings who can do that. And I truly mean that these guidance counselors know everybody in that grade. Uh, they might know the family as well. They can tell us, what strategies worked in the year before. It's been so beneficial. And we do have the school adjustment counselor, and in my experience, um, they've only worked with primarily uh, students who receive special education services. So we talked about 504s, but um, it's really been the guidance counselors who have talked to us about 504s. And with this model, I would say every year we're talking about 504s, um, we're meeting with parents, we're reviewing those 504s. And I recall a time when we didn't have this model and I don't remember ever working so closely with guidance counselors or knowing kids so well from the very beginning of the year. So for me as a teacher, I feel like losing a guidance counselor is not an option. It will really impede like, how I work with students. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Hello there, my name is Mike Waldron. Um, I have two lids today. Um, not only am I a t-ball coach, but I'm the union teacher, the teacher's union president, but I'm also the parent of three children in the Green Meadow right now. I have a soon-to-be kindergartner, I have a soon-to-be first grader, and I have a third grader that's moving up to fourth grade. So I got a couple concerns. I'm gonna address the parent ones first. As a parent, um, looking at the middle school, those middle school years, my son being in third grade is kind of a feisty group, so to speak. Um, and I'm very overly concerned that you're reducing a guidance counselor there. I think out of all the three buildings, with the age group, the hormones, the changes that are going on as parents, we, you know, a lot of us have seen that at home. I think it's absolutely critical to have a full guidance staff at the Fowler. 
My son, who's going into the fourth grade, is also on a 504. And I have, you know, a lot vested in him as my other two, but I have a little bit more vested in him just because of his 504. All right, a lot of it deals with socialization. And as a parent with the loss of a guidance counselor, I feel that my son is losing something. Okay, so I would really strongly urge you to please consider not removing that position. With the Green Meadow, I have two more children that are gonna be in the Green Meadow for a couple more years. I'm not happy with the reductions in art, music, gym, especially library. My wife and I are both educators. My wife is a language teacher. She's dual certified in both French and Spanish. She's very familiar with the Spanish immersion program and everything that's around it. She's an expert. She knows a lot more than I do. With that in regard, I went to the last, I was at the last meeting and I appreciate the fact that, you know, you have some potential next steps and the potential next steps have to do with Spanish elective for non-version students. But as a parent, being at the last meeting, I've heard a lot of people talking about the fact that, that music, art, library, gym are all being cut. So I would hope that after hearing that, I mean that huge crowd, that I would have expected one of your potential next steps for the next budget would tr be trying to actually increase those positions back to the normal load. I mean, that would only make sense. The other thing as a future, you know, and of course I'm quoting my wife now, but as a few, you know, parent of three children that are gonna get to the high school eventually, you know, you have a Spanish immersion program and you're trying to develop it all the way up and then you get to the point where you have your highest most students and then boom, they have nowhere to go. They get up to Spanish four and then they have nothing. My wife has taught a AP Spanish, Spanish five combo class and yes, typically the numbers are low. But one of the things Maynard is dedicated to is giving those higher classes and making them available to students even if we, you know, even if it's on a limited basis in terms of the number of students. We make it work. Okay, one of the ways you make it work is you have a teacher that's willing to teach Spanish 5 and AP Spanish together. Okay, I've been a teacher here at Maynard. For this June will be 17 and a half years. Prior to that, I started working at the Green Meadow as a special ed tutor. So I have 19 and a half years vested in Maynard. Every single year, you have teachers that are going above and beyond teaching extra classes, in order for the support of the students, okay? Not only is it supporting the students, but it's also helping the town out financially, all right? And I think that needs to be noted. I, I'm just, I, I'm really, really concerned at the fact that, you know, the potential next steps, all I see is Spanish. I would have liked to have seen potential next steps, increase music, increase art, increase gym, and most importantly, increase the library. I mean, you're talking about reading literacy, how important it is in the elementary years. That sets the tone for both the, the middle school years and the high school years. I'm in, you know, I'm a sophomore, I teach primarily sophomores, juniors. And you want to see the reading discrepancies? The way you fix that is you fix that at the elementary level where the kids need it. If you fix it there, you're gonna end up solving a lot of problems on the other end. You wonder at your MCAS scores. You wonder why some students are in proficient and they can't get to advanced, or they're in needs improvement and they can't quite get to proficient. It might be simply because their literacy, literacy skills, their reading skills aren't up to par. Those should have been addressed and fixed in the elementary years. Elementary years. That's where you need to spend your money. The fact that you're thinking about cutting that back scares me. My wife and I are very blessed. When we had the little footballs, we had the footballs at, you know, three months old, four months old. Stop it. <laughs> I'll get that. Okay. At three, four months, we held the footballs and we were reading them stories. 
okay? I'm really psyched that my third, that my kindergartner going into first grade is reading Goosebumps, all right? I'm really psyched. But not all kids have that ability, and we need to remember that as educators and as parents. Okay, now I'm gonna flip the lid, okay? As your union president, I'm quite upset at the fact, and I don't like the fact, that whenever you make reductions, you mention reductions in teachers, you put it in terms of contractual issues. The contract is the contract, the budget is the budget, okay? Years ago in the 90s, I was on the FinCom for two and a half years. I looked over a lot of budgets, the water department, the school department, I've been on your end as a FinCom member. Okay, the budget is the budget, contract is the contract, it's as simple as that. Okay, so for you to say that in order to, you know, the reason why you're reducing teachers, music, art, gym, at the Green Meadow is because of contractual issues, that is incorrect. If you look back at the Green Meadow schedules, you have had years where you have had full-time music, gym, art, and there were, you know, you had schedules that worked, okay? Back before April vacation, I met with some of the people at this, at this table, and we were trying to work out a way to make the schedule, the schedule of the high school work. I understand that you want to equal the load, and I appreciate that, I really do, okay? Because no teacher should have 130-something students. I'm averaging 120 for next year, just to let you know. All my class sizes are going up. I teach advanced, world, advanced uh, world history and advanced AP history, and I have 25 and 27 in each of those classes. If you haven't taught an AP class before, it's pretty difficult with 27. But because of our district and the size of our school, no, you won't be splitting that into two separate sections for me, which would benefit the kids immensely. And I understand that. But the fact of the matter is, is all my class sizes are going up, and if the top load was 138, I'm at 120 right now, just for you to note that. There are a number of other teachers that are at the high end, 118, 120. Prior to April vacation, I met with a couple people and there was a problem with the high school schedule. And they said, how can we fix it? And they approached the union and they said, hey, do you think some of your teachers would be willing to work more than three preps? Would they be willing to work for? And I said, absolutely. How did I know that? Because this June, I've been teaching 17 and a half years, and every year, we've had things called MOAs. Okay? Memorandum of Agreement. And every year, what teachers would do when asked is, would you mind working a fourth prep? And we have a one-year agreement, it ends at the end of the school year, and then the next year, if you need that teacher to do that, to teach that same course again for the following year, we fill out another one of these pieces of paper. And we have done that ever since I've been teaching here. Why? Because teachers are dedicated to the students of Maynard. So if I'm teaching three preps and you ask me to sign a memorandum of agreement and I take on a fourth prep, I'm now technically making less money because I'm teaching more. But you know what, I don't care. Because if you ask any teacher out here, we don't go into teaching for the money. We go into the teaching for the kids. I grew up in Maynard, my family lives in Maynard, and the fact that I was able to come back to Maynard and give back to my community is the best benefit that I could ever have in my life. I just got a card from my AP um, world students, well, actually my AP US students, thanking me for doing all the review sessions at Duncan's. Yes, we had a week of review sessions. 
where I spent endless high school, seven to nine, two hours of my evening away from my three children so that I can help my students prepare for their exam. These students are so good, my AP World students are so good that they emailed me and said, you know, last Saturday, where can we meet so that we can review? I had 12 of them at Dunkin' Donuts in Stowe reviewing for their AP World exam. They were willing to give up their time, I'm willing to give up my time. And that's what the teachers of Maynard do. Prior to April vacation, I said yes, no problem. There was two teachers that we needed an MOA for. If that MOA, if those two MOAs were signed, you would have had two less teachers reduced. You would have had AP Spanish running. Excuse me, Mike, can I ask you a question? Yes. Just, uh, maybe it's my ignorance and the, obviously you know a lot more about this than Not I do. Not necessarily. But just, it seemed like a contradiction when you said that you were concerned because you were gonna have upwards of 120 students next year. Yeah. But then you also said you don't have an issue signing an MOA and adding another prep. Yeah. So you're saying you don't want to increase students, but at the same time you're saying that's okay, I'm willing to do that? Have you taught before? No, and that's okay. why I'm saying obviously. That, that's, that's the difference. Okay. Maybe you could clarify that for me, yeah. please? Yeah. The, the, the reason why I'm willing to sign an MOA, mm -hmm. get paid less technically, and you know, stress <laughs> myself out, is for them. That's why. If you've never taught, you've never been in the classroom, you wouldn't understand that. But I would hope as a parent you would appreciate it. No, and I do understand. I do teach in a professional. Well, that's great. I mean, I, I mean, I that, that's teach. great. But yeah. do, don't ask me a question that's going to sound like I'm contradicting myself. Well, it does, Mike, when you say, I'm concerned I have all these students now. Okay, my let's, let's, going let's make up. it simple. Let's make it simple. Can, can we have a conversation where I talk and you talk, yeah, please? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, you talk, it's my turn now. I'm just trying to clarify this, okay? We, like you said, the budget is the budget. We get a number from the town. We have to make that work. The contract is the contract. As you said, That's we right. have to make it work. So I'm just a bit confused about what you're saying as, first you me, say, oh, let you me, know. Let me put it in monetary. Let me just finish, please, Mike. First you're saying, well, you know, I'm, I'm very concerned I'm gonna have 120. You're making it sound like you know, that's, that's not ideal. Obviously, it's not ideal, but you're making it sound like a large issue. But at the same time, you're saying, well, that's okay. I'm willing to do that. And I appreciate your, your dedication to your job and to the students. But if what you're saying is people are, you know, teachers are willing to do that, dedicated teachers like yourself are willing to do the MOA on that, on that yearly agreement, it seems like we shouldn't still be, you shouldn't be saying one, one part being complaining about the course load, but then saying voluntarily you're taking on more. Let, 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 uh, yes. You brought up the fact that the workload was a problem, you tried to keep balance it out. Correct. All I was saying is your numbers are trying to, you're trying to lower them. I'm just telling you, I'm not complaining, I'm just telling you information wise, your numbers are going up for a lot of teachers. I'm not complaining. Okay, my workload since I started here has always been average between 110, 115 students. So that's not a problem for me. I'm not complaining. Let me make that quite clear. Okay. I'm just addressing the fact that you were trying to reduce them from one, that high of 138, and right now some of your teachers are at 120. So you might want to just look at your numbers again, please. Okay. Back to the MOA because you brought up the budget thing. If those two MOAs were signed, you would have had two less teachers let go, you would have had AP Spanish being offered, and those two teachers would have been saving the town money, which would have benefited the students. I, I think, Mike, we did hear about, we what? heard about the, the MOAs. It, go ahead. Can, oh, Jennifer, before you talk, can I just clear that up? Because, Mike, I think what you said was not factual. So okay. I'd like to share the perspective of the two people at the table with you, talking about the MOA. And the MOA, actually, uh, the two MOAs that we were talking about were indeed about the preps, but they would not have saved two teachers' positions because those two teachers still have a full-time position. They do. It's just a matter of what courses we could offer to the kids and the flexibility that we could use and possibly bring back 
AP or some other Spanish program. But Talk those two teachers, I'll let Jennifer speak because Sorry. she was at that meeting and she's been working um, with the guidance staff and the principals and she and I have been sharing drafts of the different schedules with you. And so she could probably speak more intently uh, on the fact that we actually, you know, have shared this information with you. Those two MAs, MOAs were in regard to two staff members who still have their job in the current schedule. Um, so I don't know if you want to add anything to Jennifer. Um, one of them um, was not a position that was being looked to reduce. It had more to do with what we were able to put on student transcripts, and that was one of the positions. The second position um, would have impacted class sizes, but would not have saved an entire job. The position at this point that that person may have been able to go into is at a point eight. So to, to state that there were two MOAs that would have saved two people's jobs is, is not factual. So I'm going to just say at this point, we're going to agree to disagree and move on to your next point, Michael. Okay, I just, just want to say that the MOA that was declined by you, I was just today requested to actually sign that same MOA mm -hmm. to help bring back two teachers. Yep. It didn't so, say to help bring back two teachers, it said to improve the students' schedules because we heard from the students mm -hmm. that we want to improve their schedules. And we want to be able to offer them more classes because of the <laughs> prep issue. It wasn't going to change the number of staff we were going to bring back. It's so that students' transcripts will reflect more ops course options. One more question, if I may. Of course. Um, in terms of the schedule at Green Meadow with the first, second, and third grade, does it currently, does the cur day currently end at 2.50? That's when I pick up, yeah. Same with same here. Donna, um, we're not changing pickup time next year, are we? I just wasn't sure if that was no, your question, I'm, I'm Mike. Just, I, if, if, unless I misread it, I think it shows the end of the day at 3 o'clock. It might have been a misprint, but I'm just going to check yeah, with Donna the, since she's here. Misprint. And it's there's samples. Misprint. I just want to clarify if it's a of misprint Of course. Or not. Yeah, no, I know that's a big deal if we change that. Yeah, those are just samples that yep. we tried to put together, right, and so they're the not is, exact. The first, second, and third grade is still ending at 2.50. Yeah, there's no change to the end time. Thank you for clarifying that. I just, can I just say one thing, I, because I was, I was struck by the the comment to Jamal that he hasn't taught, but I, I used to teach public school, I'm a high school English teacher, and in my last year, I taught 130 students, and I'm sort of surprised because I think the, the load at Maynard High, we're lucky, they're, they're relatively low compared to some public schools. Um, but also, I, you know, I mentioned before, as a teacher, I also know the importance of small class sizes, um, and yet, my best class that I ever taught was a class of 30, too. So there, there are, you know, there are these aberrations. Um, but I, I just want to put it in perspective that if you actually see numbers, looking at the staffing in Maynard compared to some of our comparable districts, we're very well staffed. Our numbers, we have, we have data on that as well, but we're very well staffed. I just want to say um, thank you to the teachers, <laughs> just from what Mike was saying, and just I just think it's it's obvious in our community that we all really care, and that just occurred to me to say right now, so I wanted to say that. Nice. Anne? Hi, Anne Duddy. I'm a teacher at um, Green Meadow, but I'm also a parent of three children. One has graduated, and two are still here in the district, and I also live in town. Um, first question is, uh, can you clarify what a level funded service budget means? I can clarify more in terms of what the town administrator told us, because I don't like to misuse level service, level funded, because I've heard them so many times, I always use the wrong term. I'm just going to admit that character flaw. Um, but they told us literally to only plan for contractual salary increases. And I think that, you know, Pete can chime in, but I know we also knew our utility increases. Um, I don't know if we're dealing with that internally or if we submitted that and it, it got included in a 3.75. Do you remember, Pete? Is the question, what's a level service budget? Right, so it says that we, uh, they have allocated a level service budget. Is that what it's called? So does that mean that we're getting enough money to fund things the way as is? No. Okay, so can you clarify? No. <clears throat> the amount of money that we're, <clears throat> the amount of money that we're getting um, from the town will just about cover our contractual salary obligations, okay? In addition to that, we have several other uh, 
contractual obligations, utilities, uh, transportation. We have a multi-year contract, okay? Our contract next year in transportation is increasing uh, $7,800. We have to pay that, okay? Mm -hmm. With the contractual salary number and that number and a projected increase in utilities, which fluctuates, um, and uh, an increase in our uh, special education transportation, that number exceeds the budget number that we're getting from the town. So we need to figure a way to make this work. So, uh, so it, it may, we shouldn't be calling the budget that we have in the warrant right now, it's not a true level service budget. Can I add to that, Pete? And that is, it would have been level service, it would have been closer to level service if we could continue to have all that wonderful collaboration that we talked about where the teachers and administrators would say, you know, rat, and when I was a teacher, I taught for eight years, by the way, Mary, um, I didn't like doing lunch duty. So the principal would always say to me, Bob, you know, I could use an extra class. I know, it looks like I like lunch duty, but I didn't like doing lunch duty. So the principal would say to me, thanks. The principal would say to me, Bob, I need an extra class. Would you mind teaching an extra class and you don't have to do lunch duty? And I'd say I absolutely would. And those are the kind of wonderful agreements that we had for over a decade at Maynard High School. The principals and the teachers would work collaboratively and they'd shake hands on things and everything would be okay. This year, unfortunately, when you do that, you're not following the rules. The rules are the contract. I'm a really good rule follower. I like following the rules. And so this year, because we were doing everything mutually, it got a little out of control. The numbers were pretty high. And, and the, the fairness for some teachers to have 54 kids and some teachers to have 138 kids wasn't so fair. And so as a result, we had an MOA halfway through the year that we were going to fix the schedule this year. And that's what's causing a lot of this problem because in order to fix the schedule and comply with the rules of the contract, we have to let some teachers go. We have to hire other teachers at different percentages. And that's, what, that's another part of this problem, this budgetary problem. And I believe, Pete, is it about 80% of our budget is salaries? Right. So when, you know, we're human resources heavy service. Yeah. When we have to reduce, it comes from, the, you know, from salaries. OK. Uh, I have a question on the reduction tally list B point six point um, it says on uh, number 18 MHS district add assistant principal guidance administrator is this an addition to the assistant principal that's already currently in place or is this so this was a recommendation that came out of the budget proposal document that there are a lot of questions as to how much guidance staff we need there's a lot of questions around scheduling and so a guidance administrator who was also assistant certified, assistant superintendent, uh, assistant principal certified was recommended as part of the budget process, as part of this <coughs> wish list. And by the way, when I got here, the first thing we did was we looked at all administrative staffing and we re we've been reducing staffing, administrative staffing over the five years I've been here. Last year, one of the things we did was we went from a full-time assistant principal down to a half-time assistant principal at the high school. So that's why this was considered as part of the wish list, but you can see it's pretty low on the wish list. So that's an additional yes. position? Yes. Okay, just check, clarify. If we have the money. Okay. Just repeat. Did you say it's an addition to? It would be an addition to the administrative staff we have now as part of the wish list, yes. Yeah, so that basically also another way to think about the wish list is we haven't talked about most of it. So it's not happening because there's no funding. So there's a, there's a definitely an argument that we could take those off the list for clarity. Or you could just mark Make it, it wish list, yeah. yeah. No, I mean, certainly, we can certainly improve the clarity of this document. Okay, thank you. On to the next part, sorry. I might be here for a little bit. That's fine. Um, I have a lot of notes. Um, so I feel I need to advocate for the Green Meadow students because last meeting we saw the high school students get up and they did an amazing job and I had some of those high school students so I was very proud of them to get up and advocate for themselves but I feel <coughs> the kids at Green Meadow they didn't have that opportunity so I'd like to speak on their behalf so we can all agree that the social emotional and behavioral needs of students have increased research has shown that anxiety levels have increased at the beginning of each year, as part of the responsive classroom, which is part of our social curriculum, students talk about and write about their hopes and dreams. I want to share with you some hopes and dreams the elementary students have that are important to that. 
My hope and dream is to do an outside art project. My hope and dream is to paint in art. My hope and dream is to make art so I can hang it up on my wall at home. My hope and dream is to become better at art because I want to be an artist when I grow up to teach arts to kids in school. Many students across the grades also wrote, I want to become a better reader or I want to read lots of books. Others wrote, I want to climb to the top of the cargo ladder. I also attended the principal's meeting at the um, high school and it appeared, <coughs> and maybe it's being resolved, but based on the reductions at the high school and at the Green Meadow, arts are, take, are in jeopardy. In Maynard, we have many opportunities for students to be involved in WAVM, the play, athletics, rigorous AP classes, and Spanish immersion. My concern as a parent and as a teacher is that when you reduce the arts, you are impacting another set of students who are trying to take a different path. They're not the AP kids, they're not the Spanish immersion kids, or maybe they're intertwined in there. They're not the WAVM, but is it, a, it is a core group of students who the art, that's their thing. They love the arts. I just wanted to talk about some of the specialists that are being cut at Green Meadow. Um, the librarian. The librarian, the district has paid for the librarian to attend the MassQ Technology Convention, who then she has invested and volunteered time on the Technology Committee and the Digital Citizenship Committee developing technology curriculum. She also has a postgraduate degree in reading, which is very much an asset at the elementary level. She takes the third grade students as her second block and does the computer technology that she has been trained to do. She helps promote the summer reading program at the Mater Public Library. If her hours are reduced, students will not be able to have full use of the library. She needs time to manage 529 students taking out two or more books at a time. I find it ironic that our district community service project is to increase children's access to books by donating books to the li library mat, yet we aren't going to be using our library to the best of its potential. For many students, the Green Meadow Library is the only place they go to access books. They don't use the public they don't have an opportunity to go out and buy a book unless the book fair comes in to the <coughs> library and then they're able to buy a book. I know we tend to focus on instruction, but I think being exposed to many books and having the opportunity to explore books is equally important. At Green Meadow, you have the opportunity to enrich 529 elementary students. I would hope that it is a priority, especially if money isn't the issue. Kindergarten has the music, song, dance, and extra block, which is part of their social curriculum and it's developmentally appropriate. Music is therapeutic. PE, first grade, we hear how much health and wellness is important. We focus on the food, but here we are cutting an extra gym class where we could promote more exercise. Art, it's therapeutic in treating anxieties. Before and after park, students were coloring, coloring sheets that were given out by Mrs. Small to reduce their anxieties. Talk about the technology. Um, the budget mentions that the students will still attend these specials, and I think that's great. But I just want you to be aware, if these positions are reduced, I hope you realize that in doing that, the opportunity for concerts, art shows, field days, book fails will be compromised. Because as it was stated last meeting by a parent in a, who is a parent here but teaches art in a different district, you are asking these professionals to service the same number of students, which is 529, on a reduced schedule. And I just wanted to address the class size. It's not so much the numbers, and I think we get caught up at looking at a spreadsheet and we see 24, that's manageable. But I think what we also need to look at, as we did with the high school students, those are 24 little students that we look as individuals. So 24 is a number, but when you look at those individual students, there are educational considerations to take in place, their needs, and not all needs are the same just because it's 24. And the last thing I wanted to point out was 
we were handed a brochure as parents and as teachers. And one of the things that is a district academic initiative says small class sizes rivaling private schools programming. That was from the school. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. I apologize right off the bat. I'm a Harvard public speaker. Um, I think there's so many numbers floating around. I'm not even sure if this question is the wish list question that doesn't even matter anymore. <laughs> but it says something about there's a school slash town assistant facilities director. Is that the wish list? Is it, it's no longer existing? We're, that not is, wishing, um, we're not wishing for that anymore. <laughs> no, and to be honest, I'm not either, personally. Um, that is something the town has asked us to look into, um, okay. but they have not funded it. So I call it a wish list. Right, because I was looking at that list. number and it was like $58,000. So I was wondering, are we solely as the school funding that, or is that a $116,000 position? Uh, hold on, so let me just look. No, so I'm looking at item number yeah. 17, it which goes. It says $58,000. Yep. Right. And then it says town slash school. So I can't. Right. Confuse. And just to be very, very clear, it's not in the budget at all. And I know that that's hard to understand. This sheet is, right. so is a I difficult was like, one. I was like, wow. Yep. Am that, I is not, that is absolutely not in the am budget. Am I wishing for that? Am I not wishing for that? I think the slash was that it's a collaborative position because the town really wanted to work with us collaboratively on our maintenance and facilities. Right. And so they were working on something, a position that would work in both realms, but that we would pay for it at 58,000. Right. It's not doubled, it's not 58 and 58. Wow, because I was gonna say. So I it's 50, yeah, that would be a lot. That no, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> that's a good question. <laughs> the other thing that I need to do is, I am a resident of Maynard. I have four children. My youngest is a senior in high school. So I'm <coughs> at the end of my journey in, in that respect. Um, and as a parent, I need to say thank you to the Maynard School District. I have always been very proud of the Maynard Schools and of what they provided for my children. Unfortunately, um, we're looking at numbers, 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 numbers. And that is not, my kids have come here and they never felt like they were a number no child should feel like they are a number. And what the teachers provide is beyond numbers. And we look at all sorts of factors and all of that, and we can paint pictures any way we want to. But as teachers, we look at those children, and what we want is for them to be able to reach their academic potential. And if you have all of these professionals Right, we are a professional staff saying to you, lower the class size, keep them small, let us do our job, let us meet their needs, let us help them <coughs> grow emotionally, socially, let us make learning communities. You can't look at the numbers. And we have, I've been here for a long time, we used to have six, seven sections grade levels. So this is very recently that we've started to roll back. My kids had the benefit of the small class sizes to the point where my oldest daughter worked for Maine at Public Schools. She was handpicked out of trying to figure out where she was going. They said, Maggie, you need, can you come and work? Mr. Venaria, is not well, we need you. And because she loved her biology teacher that much and felt like she needed to give back, she was petrified. She's this big, she looked like a high school student. She went in there and worked and worked and worked. She didn't care about numbers. She cared about Mr. V, she cared <coughs> about giving back. Her hands were tied. So when you say contract, 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 it's insulting because she was not trying to work by a contract, by a piece of paper. What she said is, I need help in order to do my job and to do it well, to be able to give back to these kids what I got from Mr. V. And if you are not going to give me what I need, I will not do this job. 
She taught all of us a lesson. So when you are making your decisions, <laughs> when you are making your decisions, please really, really stop and think about what is best for all of the kids so that you can take a look and a step back and hopefully be really proud of the decisions that you made because I was very proud of the decision that my daughter was forced to make. <laughs> um, and just one comment on the Title I. So I feel like Title I, we go round and round and round. So we're looking for three shared Fowler GM paraprofessional tutors. I think it was two, three years ago. I, I, I don't know if any of you were serving at the time. We were sitting here arguing whether to cut them or keep them. So we cut them. And guess what? Now we're back trying to get them. So I think once we have them, I think we keep them because we're going to need them. It goes round and round and round. And I just feel like it's a game of ping pong. Once we get them, we keep them. My name is Madison Berry, and I'm a sophomore at Maynard High School. And I have a quick comment, and then I have a question that hopefully you guys can answer. Um, so I'm in five core classes, and two of them, my French and my math class, have like 17 or 18 students. My history class has 11 students, and my biology and my English class have 27 or 28 students. And it's so much easier no matter like what anyone says, as from a student's perspective, to learn in a class with 11 students rather than a class with 27. And you have my honors biology class. I have two great friends who are so smart, and they couldn't get into the bi honors biology class because it was a fire hazard. And it's just it's <laughs> frustrating because you want to offer as many like, opportunities for your students as you can, but you can't because it's a fire hazard. And then I have a quick question because I really like biology. I've had the pleasure of having two great teachers within one year. And um, I signed up next year to take AP Biology. And I also signed up to take French 4. And I know that every single language 4 class is D-block. And AP Biology is D-block. And I have a friend who's on the school site council and he said that they are trying to cut classes with students, like ranging from 10 to 8 students per class. And hearing from my guidance counselor, um, only 12 students signed up to take AP Biology, and one of them already dropped out because he'd rather take French. And I personally would like to pursue a career in science, and even if I can't take AP Biology, I can't take AP Physics because it's at the same time as AP Lang. So if I want to take AP Biology, I have to drop French, which is just a different story. But um, if enough people don't take AP Biology and there's only like eight kids, is that going to be cut? Not likely. When we were looking at small class sizes, it was with initial requests. So the list that you saw was with the number of requests that students had. Um, and we went through that list very carefully. And you noticed that there were some on there um, that were seven or eight. And then there are also going to be sections of seven or eight that are running for other classes. So it wasn't sort of a hard and fast rule. At this point, we've assigned that class and that section to an individual, to a teacher. Um, and so the likelihood of that happening unless all 12 of you decide you don't want to do it. I mean, at that point, yeah, we, we need to make a decision. Um, but no, it, it is, I won't say impossible because I've learned never to say impossible, but it is very, very unlikely that that would happen. Um, I was just going to pull up the D block issue and I can look at that. I do know, and I don't know specifically, I, I you know, looked at the schedule so much, I think my eyes have crossed, but at this, um, so I don't know specifically if all of the advanced language offerings are there. I believe you that that's the case. One of the things that's hard in the schedule is that we have students who, especially students like yourself that take a lot of advanced classes, generally speaking, there's between 
10 and 20 something students who want to take those classes and so that equates to to one section and so when you're trying to fit all of the students in with all of your requests and this is not a function of what we're doing this year this is a function this happens every year i'm sure you could talk to upperclassmen who have had to make similar choices but we can look at the schedule for d block and see if there's something we can do um and certainly when you're have you had your guidance counselor meeting um, yeah, I've had a, a few. You've had a few, <laughs> okay. Um, so I meet with the guidance counselors as well. So we'll take a look at D-Block and see if there is something we can do, but um, it does need to sort of fit within the parameters of the 498 students, I think, that at the high school, all right? Thank you. Yeah. Can, I, can I add, though, that um, just to let you know, I was uh, an assistant principal and I worked on the schedule of a school with 1,400 students, so we had lots and lots of classes. But this, a schedule is like a puzzle and especially for kids, sometimes there's always gonna be conflicts, and especially <coughs> some of our you know, really cool programs like band or like, you know, those tend to create some conflicts, so we always try to put the puzzle together to help to maximize the number of students who can get the classes, but even in a school with 1,400 kids where I served, we, there's still gonna be some conflicts, which is why we have guidance counselors helping you out, um, and it, it's not just you, and it's not just the school, it happens in every school. I just wanna assure you that, but we're gonna do our best to help you, and, We've been working really hard on that schedule. Thank you. Thanks, Maddie. Brenda Sullivan, I'm a teacher here at Fowler. I was at the high school for many years until they cut courses there, and I was bumped down to the middle school. Um, I just kind of want to clarify some things because it's confusing, and I know that, as you know, you have highly intelligent people here. Um, and people are going, what are they talking about? Where is that coming from? You're not alone. We yes. need it too, and so go ahead. And being a lifelong member, as were my parents and my grandparents of Maynard, and have had my entire family graduate from Maynard High School, we know how the rumor mill goes and the talking goes. So there was just a few things that we're curious about because I don't know about the rest of them, but I feel as a teacher that I'm hearing this from that one, that from this one, and getting no facts from nobody who actually should be providing the facts to the faculty as it comes about. Um, Dawn, you said that you prioritized your meetings because you thought that cutting jobs was a more important topic than the Spanish immersion, which was another big topic last, yep, so we'll the do last that meeting. Our next meeting is the 26th. The jobs wasn't gonna change today, but um, you don't think that if the Spanish immersion issue had anything to do with job issues? Like you thought they were both two different topics? Can I? Can I I'm asking yeah, that as a yeah, question, you're, you're not asking, as, because so I don't know. I see, you know, there's even former, I've talked to some former school community members who were here when we actually instituted Spanish immersion. So the Spanish immersion, uh, and, and in fact, I've actually heard that students have been told that the reason why high school teachers are losing their jobs is because of Spanish immersion. And if you look at the contract, High school teachers are a class one, elementary teachers are a different class. Oh, yeah. It's all based yeah. on certification, as you well know. You're, you know. Yeah, I understand and, that. And so they have nothing to do with each other. Now, some of the concerns that were raised about the class size is when we institute Spanish immersion, we said, first of all, you have to have five or six sections. So whether you have a Spanish immersion teacher or whether you have a general ed teacher, it's not costing you an extra teacher. So right. even though I know this is what we're gonna go over at the next meeting, what are the costs? It, they're really, it's pretty much a wash as far as the cost because if we have to, we ordered new books for uh, math, Go Math. So we now have these consumable Go Math books. Every year we would order 140 books or whatever the class size is, 118, 95. Now instead of uh, all English books, we order you know 85 English books and 25 Spanish books. So it's kind of a wash. Right. So there's no, no additional cost. I, I understand that. I don't, so, I don't but, but your question is the, the, that kids are hearing and adults are hearing that the Spanish immersion is the result of these layoffs. Is, is the result of some, right. And it's not. And so the, the concerns about why people are getting um, laid off have to do with schedules that, and contractual obligations that we had problems at with. At the high school, at the high school level, at right? At the high school. Right. Okay. Uh, how about Green Meadow and Fowler? So professional teachers, are you losing their job or they're being cut to make room for Spanish the new immersion. program? No, so the Spanish immersion this year. Well, just the, the, the fourth grade. No, the Spanish immersion this year, the one teacher who lost their position was a first year teacher. So yeah. it wasn't a professional status teacher. 
which is what we've strived to do through attrition when we hire new teachers, because we have a lot of retirements every year. So when we hire them, we say, well, you're on a one-year contract. We're not guaranteeing you another job because we have the Spanish Immersion Program that we're going to keep filling positions in. Now, this year, because we've been talking about class sizes, there was one elementary professional status teacher who was listed in the considerations, mm -hmm. right? And it hasn't been decided yet whether that's going to happen or not. But it didn't have to do with Spanish Immersion. It had to do with the class size discussion. And so the, the school committee has been listening to the class size discussion at every meeting. Mm -hmm. They'll probably make a decision regarding that tonight. But it hasn't affected a professional status teacher. OK. Now, another rumor mill. And if you don't want to, you don't have to. But I just think No, that, I appreciate you asking. No, um, at this, question, this next question, if you don't want to, you don't have to. But I think that it would put some things in perspective because of chat around town. How many of you have a student currently in or going into Spanish Emerging next year? And can I just say that the program existed before I joined the board? Oh, yeah. So no, I, I, oh, I, I no I'm just kidding. Like, but but people would just, every, that. I'm just telling you what I'm hearing downtown, in the schools, the reason why we're Spanish Emerging well, is so important. We're more than happy to clear of, up any rumors. And so. don't believe well, everything you see on Facebook. So, like, I know I'm not a mated mom, that. and I don't even have a Facebook. Well, I do, but it's for that's the class of mated high school class of 1980 is the only one that's on. <laughs> All okay. right. What else you got? All right. The other question that I have was um, we didn't really see any middle school changes here. Are there no changes coming in the middle school? Uh, there was at the bottom of the list. Um, okay. So we had been working with the middle school, too, on the schedule. And, mm -hmm. um, and one of the things we've identified that I think you may have pointed out was in the past, unfortunately, some health and PE classes were reduced from the high school. Um, I think it was just before I got here. And so it we're was. shifting. We it had a good it was just the year I got that. here. Day I one. Yeah. So uh, one of the recommendations was to shift the PE teacher. We have two here, as you know, and to shift a, one to half time here and half time there to add staff to the high school schedule because we're trying to make the schedule work and also. So then there will be cuts here in PE? It'll be one and a half PE. Right now there's two no, PE No, I mean teachers. for the students' classes. So kids who now have PE twice a week, it's now going to be once a week? Is that how it's going to work? I don't know the specifics of the schedule. I've talked, worked with Mr. Fleming on this in the um, Fowler Scheduling Committee. Um, so there will be a reduction in the PE Actually, I think times it's and minutes. Four, but six. there's an increase in the number of recess. Um, because sixth, seventh, sixth and seventh grade will have recess, and that was something. So that we're saying that PE is interchangeable with recess. The scheduling committee, when we had the conversation, that was something that they had talked about. So, and actually, I believe it's a point six PE here, point four at the high school. One point six, one point four. No, one person. They'll teach point six here. Yeah, but I mean total. Do we have one point six here? One point one point six there? One point four here? 1.4 there, 1.6 here. Right. In total, when you, if you have three and you split them up, it's not 1.5, 1.5, because it's going to so be So is that where we're looking at for Fowler? So yes. cuts in PE and cuts in guidance? Is that? I'm, I'm just curious, because I really yep. see nothing really about Fowler in here. Yes, right now there will be a reduction in uh, physical education here. OK. Uh, I wanted to, to share a little bit more data with folks. Um, just to put, to give you some more numbers to work with, we, we did a lot of looking at comparable districts, so districts that um, are similar, similar to Maynard in terms of demographics, in terms of size, um, and Littleton, I'll give you a, just a couple statistics. So Maynard has a total of 1,312 students, so that's across the district, and we have 128 teachers total, 73 paraprofessionals, so that's for Maynard. So just kind of keep those numbers in your, in your head. Um, Millis, which we've looked to a lot. Millis had a Spanish immersion program, so we've, gone, we've visited there. Um, similar to Maynard. And, I'm sorry? Millis has. Has, has, has. has. Present tense, yes. Um, so Millis has 1,407 students. They have 95 teachers and 23 paraprofessionals. Littleton has 1,584 students with 106 teachers and 55 paraprofessionals. 
So I just feel like for me, I know I, as an idealist and as a teacher, I know I, I appreciated what um, Mrs. Jones said about, you know, you, wanna, you don't want to think about numbers and I always want to think about my students, um, your kids, you know, your children. Um, and I love the, the job that our teachers do here. And yet at the same time, we're, we're challenged with looking at numbers when we're looking at the budget. And we have to look at these statistics and I look at them and I feel pretty good about our staffing in Maynard. So I just wanna, I wanna hopefully we can share this at some point out with the public. Um, I'm happy to repeat it if anyone wants me to. Uh, hi, my name's Jacob. Um, I just have, I, I hate public speaking, so. Um, <laughs> A lot but of us we all don't do. Like it either. Yeah. <laughs> one thing I keep hearing over and over is numbers. How do we how do we increase the school budget? No one no one's asked that. How, how does a, as a community how do we increase our school budget? Yeah, I mean the bottom line is it's it's obviously a big question. The bottom line is, and I'll tell anybody that asks me this because I'm, you know, this is my second year on the school committee, and every year, you know, someone got up at the last meeting and said, why do we always talk about cuts? Why can't we talk about adding? That's great. We don't like to do this. This is our least favorite part of being on the mm -hmm. school committee. Yeah, I, I sympathize right now. So the biggest thing is this town needs more commercial tax revenue. This town needs to make more money. The only way that's going to happen is you've got a small town, small landmass. See, there's only so many residential that you can fit in. There's too much, you know, empty storefronts downtown. We need to develop 129 Parker. The mill and main, we have to you know, max those out oh, yeah. with commercial tax revenue. The bigger issue with this town is that we have, for the small space that we do have, there's a lot that's vacant. So we're not maxing out the potential that we do have. So we'd love to come to you every year and say, look at all these positions that we're adding as opposed to cutting. Now the sad reality is that when we have that, we talked about level service budget that we get approved on the town meeting at the, with the warrant, that's what we have to work with. So we have to make that work, and yeah. it's not ideal. I'm not asking yeah, yeah. So you. I'm, as asking. a community, how yeah. do we increase yeah. so, the school um, budget? So just like Don said before, you've got 75 people that show up to town meeting that vote on decisions that affect all of you, everybody in here. And this is a, obviously a very small percentage of the people that live in this town. We have to get more commercial tax revenue in this town. And yes, I am passionate about this, in case you couldn't tell. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Jacob, you know, sort of procedurally, um, Pete, do you know offhand what percent of the overall town budget we get? Is it like 60% or, I know it wavers a little bit here. Yeah, there. it's roughly 60, 65%. So out of the overall town municipal budget, the schools get 60 to 65%, don't quote us, but it's a large chunk of money, considering mm -hmm. we're also funding fire, police, DPW, and things like that. So at the end of the day, you know, one way to increase what we get would be an override. So we, similar to how they got the Maynard High School, um, a group of concerned parents, staff said we need a new high school, you have a movement, you get folks to, you know, put things together and get it on a ballot and vote yes. Um, so that's the nutshell version. Um, we can also additionally advocate to the Board of Selectmen, um, similar to what we did in February at the town budget meeting, um, that we would love more funding. And obviously we say it very professionally. We bring 42 pages of documents and now we have probably 242 pages of documents, which is great. Um, so there are ways to get more money. There's no way to get more money fast, but what, that's part of what we do for you behind the scenes is we're always advocating. Um, so how know. can I how can I help with that process? Yeah, I mean, I, I get that feeling that folks want to sort of take that on for next year. And I'm happy to meet with folks offline and give a more eloquent sort of a step two guide of what's what's possible um, and we're certainly bringing the message to the board of selectmen in a collaborative way that we're hearing from a lot of parents because you know my time as selectmen and being involved in the town i always saw school committees doing their best and managing frugally and taking that message and applying to the budget and i feel like this is the first year we're really feeling it um, yep. as much as i still don't i still will say till the ends of the earth we're not in a crisis you know this is just this is these things are yep, personal I, I don't want it to get to a crisis no so no so i'm just but at, my point is we will be if the selectmen aren't hearing it through the town letting them know that we've done the frugal we've done the checkbook we've checked everything twice we need to you know what we'd like to present to them and the previous school committees have a growth budget so Yes, you give us your message, your fiscally prudent message, but this is what we would like to do and this is what it would pay for. Um, and previous school committees have done a wonderful job with that. Sometimes you get a little, sometimes they get a little more. And I, and I will give Dr. Girardi kudos. He's, 
he's done very well in the money getting. <laughs> um, so. Well, we work collaboratively with the town, and the town is very generous to us. It's just, um, but, but it's just the pool's only our so message. big, right? Yeah. Well, that's yeah, what it is, the pool's right. only so big, so we and we are collaborative with them. But you know, getting our message across. So, as I think the important message that you said in the beginning of your slides was. The budget doesn't stop today. Regardless of what decisions get made on this budget, the budget continues at every meeting. How do we, you know? So, uh, when we're advocating and we go to the board of selectmen and, and we ask to meet with them and we say next year, whatever our priority is, well, we've heard that it's class sizes. We want to hire three additional teachers, one for every grade level at Green Meadow. We're going to need everybody to come with us. So the board of selectmen see it's not just the school committee who wants a wish list. This is real people who want something. And that's the process that we'll need your support on. But the budget doesn't stop today. Whatever decisions get made, the budget goes on, and we need you, you know, to pay attention, visit these meetings, you know, when they're on TV, see what's going on, uh, look at the agendas when they come on, and if you see something that says budget, come and visit us and, and help support us. So we appreciate you asking. And circling back to the other part of your question is what can you do? If, if you feel like we as a school group could benefit from additional funding, go visit the selectmen. You know, if we, if we start getting concerned individuals going and sitting in the select <clears throat> meetings, yes, you said there's only one pool of money, but they can reconsider the way that they carve that, mm -hmm. that pool of money up. Mm -hmm. They can consider the amount of money that they're leaving in the budget that gets certified at free cash for the end of the year. We're not in a fiscal crisis, but I think we can reevaluate as a citizenship the way that we spend money in this town. I like to be safe. I want to know that we have good police officers and good firefighters and good DPW services. I want you know my water to taste good. I want all of those things. But when you're talking when you're talking fifty thousand dollars here, a hundred thousand there, you're talking tenths of a percent of the overall pool of money. And by getting people engaged and taking that conversation back to the select committee, who in every way, shape, and form is heavily involved in this process, then they're going to hear that maybe that one-tenth of one percent, or maybe that 0.5 percent, maybe that comes next year so that we don't have to talk about what are we cutting, yeah. and maybe next year we could be celebrating about what are we adding. And if we can get the overall pool to grow up, go up, mm -hmm. obviously that helps everybody. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and if the official sort of... I don't want to say there's an official kickoff for budget season because we sort of talk about it all the time. Um, but there is sort of a, a, it kicks off for the whole town, let's say in November. Not to say we don't have some meetings before that for sure. Um, but one takeaway I certainly have heard uh, the past few meetings is, you know, we'll have a budget timeline. So I don't feel, I, I never want people to feel that they have to come to every meeting. I love having you here. I, you got the time, this I got the time. I'm going to be here. To an empty room. Um, but you also don't have to go to every meeting to make a difference. So I can be better about posting our um, budget timeline schedule of meetings on our new Facebook page, our major public schools one. Um, I'm hesitant to post anything anywhere else because I just don't get involved in that anymore. But, um, but I'm happy to put it on our official pages and then people will know there's a big budget meeting the second Saturday of every second Saturday in February every year, according to the Maynard Town Charter. Um, and that's a great one to go to because that's when we, we present, the town presents, the finance committee listens, uh, representing sort of the residents. Um, so there's a lot of great ways to get involved. I just don't want people to ever think it's an overwhelming thing to actually get involved and make a difference because it's not. So I know it's not popular, but how do you start an override? <laughs> it's, a long, it's, a, it's just a longer conversation. So if you want to talk to me offline, I am very happy to provide any of that. I just don't. I, I, it's, there are other residents who have approached yeah. me about the same thing, so I love to connect people with like-minded thoughts and get them together. And, so. and Jacob, I'm the senior member on the committee now. I'm ending my third year, so this is a relatively new committee. But this is the third year that I've been a part of the committee where the topic of an override has come up. So it's getting to the point where it's feeling like there's more and more groundswell for that. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of people who study town budgets that are convinced that every community needs to have a budget override approximately every 10 years or so. Those are the people that crunch numbers for a living. We haven't had one in recent memory. So we might, it might be due. Okay. So we can continue that conversation, absolutely. Yep. I'm pretty sure Rose has my email, so feel yep. free to, we'll get connected and we'll, we'll continue this. And thank okay. you for asking the question. Okay. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. My name is Carrie Bailey McCurvis, and I have a first grader, and I spoke back in, I think, April. Um, but not all of the school committee members were here. 
So I just wanted to say that I am an educator. I'm a stay-at-home mom right now to a first grader and also a four and a half year old. But I, you know, have my degree in elementary ed and my master's in reading. So knowing what an important foundation you're trying to build with your kindergarten through second, third grade for reading is huge. You're setting the bar for kindergarten for our second graders all the way to get you through Fowler and Maynard High School. This is not a joke. It's not to, you know, let them pass by and just, you know, okay, yeah, sh you know, he or she can read this level. You want them to succeed. My child is in, my daughter is in a, the class that has 23 students. And she has, you know, I'm constantly asking, like, how did you do with your reading today, your writing? I'm constantly asking because I'm interested. I know what to look for because I was in the classroom. There's a lot of parents that don't, and I'm not saying you know, that's a bad thing, but you know, they weren't in the classroom. Um, but these teachers are dealing with large class sizes. It's not fair to them. It's not fair to the teachers, and it's not fair to the children. And I work with my daughter at home, but she's exhausted at you know, seven o'clock at night, you know, <laughs> dealing with you know, tantrums and stuff like that. But as Mrs. Duddy said, you know, she had me thinking when I went into my daughter's classroom at the beginning of the year and I was taking pictures because both my husband and I could not be there for back to school night and I was taking pictures of her work and it stood out to me and I just looked it up on my phone that I took a picture of her thing that says, my dream for this year is to be a better reader, she wrote. Nice. And she said, and how will I achieve that? By working hard. Mm -hmm. And she does work hard. But she's an average student, and as like we were talking about the Title I program, because she's an average student, she doesn't receive extra services, but I'm afraid that because of large class sizes, she's not getting the reading instruction that she needs, and that she will fall behind. And that concerns me, especially as an educator with my master's in reading. We said that you know having services give them a core foundation for a Title I. And that's what we need to look at for all of the general education, not just Title I or. Um, the other thing is, and you know, I just, my thing is, I constantly hear, like we talk about like numbers and everything, but I'm constantly hearing, you know, us comparing Maynard to s all these other towns. Why are we comparing ourselves to other towns? Why don't we compare ourselves to ourselves in Maynard and be proud of who we are? I only uh, moved to Maynard two years ago. We were living in Acton in a small condo. We moved to Maynard because it was a small, a small town. It reminded me, the downtown, even though it's a lot of vacancies, it reminded me of my hometown and I grew up in Lexington. I'm proud to be here with, in Maynard with my family, and I'm proud to have my children go through the Maynard Public Schools. I graduated with a class of over 400. There's people, I'm ready to do my 20 year reunion, and there's people posting, and I don't even know half of them. Mm -hmm. But I know my daughters will know all their classmates, and I'm proud of that. But you need to look at the, clo the class sizes for Green Meadow and make sure that they are on the low side for small class sizes. As Mrs. Study said, you know, she pointed out like we are proud of our small classes and that's what we need to do for our students and our teachers. You know, being a teacher myself, I mean, that's, they have a hard job. You know, it doesn't end at three o'clock. They go home and do more work. They spend hours on the weekends planning for the week. I get it. And I give them so much credit because I don't know, being a parent of two kids and having a classroom, I'm like, right now, eventually I will go back. But I give them huge kudos because it's not an easy job. It really is not. And to put more pressure on them with more kids, and there are more learning disabilities and more social issues and everything, and to have more children in the classroom, it's just not fair. And it's not fair to the kids, and it's not fair to the teachers. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maureen Mancini. I have um, a child in Fowler about to go into fifth grade and a Green Meadow student. 
And kind of piggybacking on what you said, we all know that Google can be everybody's best friend or worst enemy, but I'm wondering if you could cite where this research came from, because while I was just sitting back there, I Googled class size and found five articles that say that class size is more important than number 18. So I would love to read the article that this came from. So it's, I don't know if that can go on your official page where you're getting yeah, this sure. research Jennifer. from. Or it, the, um, research is John, the researcher is John Hattie, and his um, article is Making Thinking Visible. Um, we can put, and he's actually, since that piece came out, um, he's actually done another meta-analysis, so there's additional information. Um, but it's John Hattie making Thinking Visible, and we can put all of the data up there. So he, so that would suggest that it's more important that I would send my child to summer school than to have a smaller class size? No, read it from the top down, top most important. Because summer school's towards the bottom, right? Summer school's at the well, bottom. Well, but summer, school summer school was like right above television or something, nope, I think. No, summer school is above class size. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think, and homework is and I think your size. point about you can Google, well, I mean, that's for the thing about data, right? You can get data on both sides of any issue on any topic in the world. And I think that that's a great point. I, I don't discount that point at all. And then I just wanted to make a point, just as a listener, when I heard, oh, he's not here anymore, the gentleman in the green hat saying that he was willing to sign a memorandum of understanding. To me as a listener, it didn't sound like that was contradicting. It was sounding like his hand was being forced to sign a memorandum of understanding, that if that's all that he could do, that's what he would do. So that's just the takeaway I got from that piece. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tara Lavolsi. I have three children in the district. And she actually asked the same question I was going to ask, but I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about this since you included it. So you said it, so it came from someone who wrote a book, right? He wrote a book about this study? Uh, this is, I don't know how many, he's written multiple books, yes. He's okay. a major researcher and he conducted, he conducted a meta-analysis, you're probably better at explaining how that all <laughs> works and no, what that okay. means, um, of thousands of um, studies done in education, compiled them and then came up with this ranking and it's, it's been reevaluated four times. Three so, times. So, so what does he define as class size, as small class size? I'm not sure I'd have to go back to what he's looking at specifically, but generally speaking, small mm -hmm. class sizes is between 16 and um, 18 is the ideal, and then anything below 20 for the class size research, you begin to see an impact. Do you recall specifically? Well, I did try to read the book online a little bit, and so Amazon has like free page views, so I was, and it skips some pages on you, so I was like, ah! right. Um And I couldn't read the whole thing, because it's 100 something pages, sorry, before I, we had all these meetings, so I could really give some good information. But um, he was saying class size, class size of 20 to 30. Okay. That was what he says in the book. Okay, so just a few questions. So things like, do we have a response to intervention? Is that at Green Meadow? We do. It's in, is it at Fowler? It is, but we want to improve upon it by adding the Title I services. That was part of the growth model. And feedback, which is, I agree, it's, I'm also an educator. Um, feedback is extremely important. And some of the studies I've looked at talked about, I mean, class size would make a big difference for offering feedback. So if you have, if you have 25 kids in a first grade classroom, Sure. The quality of feedback is only going to increase yeah, if you I, have a smaller class size. Sure. I think the point of um, the work that he did was, you know, in terms of looking at allocation of resources and, and, and not just in terms of dollars, but also in terms of time, where should educators be spending their time um, and where should we be spending our resources. So he was right. looking at all of these pieces together. Obviously, one thing does not remove from the other. Um, we are, we're not talking about, you know, creating widgets. We're talking about kids who are... Um, very different and diverse and have different needs and don't respond the same ways to the same thing. So, um, you know, it is not a pure science, it is a so social science, which has all of its implications and flaws. Right. I, so, I, I, again, I fully agree. I just, if we want to offer them direct instruction, if we want to offer them meaningful feedback, if we want to be able to maintain good classroom management, <coughs> we need to have the right amount of staff. Well, yeah, and what classroom. he is saying is that when you control for those right. things, so with those things being equal, right. that these other things have a much greater impact. So that there could be one school that have 25 <laughs> kids, another school uh, on average, another school that has 18 on average, but this school of 25 is implementing those higher up right. things in a, in a very systematic and disciplined way. And, and when they're really doing it, compared to that school that could have the 18, 
it's actually um, class size isn't the thing. It's that, the thing that there, it's the, the things that are above class size that you see on that list. Right. So, but like the, na I think it's the National Council for Teachers of English, <coughs> they absolutely disagree with the study. They think that it's yeah. more important because that's where you're, again, they're teaching them the foundation they need yeah. to be successful. Yeah. And I think um, that should be part of the conversation because it does seem like they go together and I why I want to read the whole book. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. And something like summer school. Now I know that's offered, I know it's for a fee, but I know that's offered to the Spanish immersion students. Is it offered to all students? Or has been in the past, maybe I'm wrong, but is there a program for the Donna, Spanish how immersion? Donna, camp. how does that work? It was a one week camp. Okay. Okay. And so, so I'm assuming if the other teachers in the other grades want to offer the same thing, like we don't, I mean the building's open. Yeah, okay. So, oh, so, so if there's. I'm it's a fee-based program, kind yeah. of like Excel and FAST, and we have right. these programs and the Spanish immersion parents said, yeah, we'd be willing to have, pay a fee to have a one week camp. Right. So we so said, we'll be glad to put it on. So are there other, so in the, so the, the, the other children that are not in Spanish immersion, yeah. have they been offered we need the, a summer we need program? The teachers first. So if teachers want to, I'm not putting it on them. I'm not, okay. Because there's no way to say it that sounds like I'm not putting it on them. Right. But it's the same with like the extra concert in June. Anybody, right. We can organize any activity for any grade. It just takes... Staffing. Every, staff, yeah. But that doesn't, you know, I, I can't say it that it doesn't sound like I'm criticizing anyone. But yeah, if, if people want to offer their incoming class, a one-week class, okay. and parents pay the fee to go, right. it's, not, it's not based on language. It's based okay. on... The teachers in Spanish immersion are offering the parent it. desire. So. When parents ask for something, we try to develop it for them. Okay. So their parents are also asking for small class size. Right. So maybe and that'll work out. Right. All we're right. listening to it. <laughs> Hi, Mike Sullivan again. Um, I wanted to talk specifically about fourth grade class size. Um, it's a little bit selfishly because that most directly impacts me at the seventh grade level. We appreciate um, your disclosure on that point. So I want you, like, I'm going to talk about me. Um, with the class sizes, one thing that I want to point out is that the, the averages are great for like, data and really getting like, the overview, but when you look at specific class sizes, there's like a class that has 25 students and a class that has 20. Um, and some of that I know is based upon grouping of students and resources um, for that. But when we're looking at it, when, and when we're thinking about different children, um, they aren't created equally. These classes are not created equally. They are created um, sort of with like, this is a group of students that need to be together. This is another group, especially as they go from, I believe, Green Meadow up into fourth grade. And when I think about the class sizes for this current year, like 25, it actually um, was manageable because we had a literacy specialist who was just at Fowler who provided intervention on a regular basis, not just in that class, but in all the classes. And I think fourth grade is a grade that we don't normally consider class size, but because it's the first grade at Fowler, it's a new school, a new set of rules, um, just understanding what it's like here. I think it's different than if it was a fourth grade that was the last class at Green Meadow, because um, I know how the seventh graders are, they're like big man on campus now, uh, just like eighth grade was when they were here. And so I think that thinking about their position in the school is also a factor in there that doesn't really come across on the data. And considering the reduction from someone separate at Green Meadow and someone separate at Fowler, that the interventions that would be happening for literacy may not happen as effectively or as regularly as they were this year. And then for me, as a seventh grade teacher, I deal with class sizes as, as they come. I, I'm going to be the ELA teacher, I'm just gonna deal with the group that comes. But if they're not getting the opportunity for intervention at that younger grade, I'm looking at differentiating for possibly 25 entire students. It's not about differentiating between groups. I'm tutoring 25 students, perhaps, in that group. Um, where I need that, that interventionist, I need somebody who can help them right from that fourth grade, as soon as they enter Fowler, who knows our ELA vision, who knows our curriculum, and the fourth grade can then build upon those skills, fifth grade can build upon those skills, and then sixth and seventh grade, like, we, we got it. Like, we can differentiate with the groups that we have there. So I really think that the fourth grade is a much bigger picture than just these numbers that are here. Thank you.
I would say that that's part of the reason we're having these conversations because it's not just data. We need, we need some place to begin to start to make some decisions that are hard to make and wrap our heads around it. So we apologize if it feels to you like we're th slamming data down your throats. It's really meant as a, as a starting point and a place for us to begin to make thoughtful decisions. That's all. So that's why we appreciate being able to fill in with community experience and really understand where people are coming from. Hi, my name is Jennifer O'Leary, and I have three students in the schools. I have a fourth grader, a seventh grader, and a ninth grader. Um, and I really appreciate all the parents and teachers and everyone that's been here tonight. It usually doesn't take me this long to get up to the, get my two cents in. We know. Um, I, I wanted to speak to a whole bunch of different things, um, so I'm trying to be organized about it. But uh, as far as the counselor at the Fowler School, the guidance counselor, uh, there, someone brought up the issues of 504s, but there's also the issues of IEPs, individual education programs for students, and they provide those services. So um, that has to be considered when you're thinking about eliminating that position because IEPs have to be filled, they're contractual agreements. Um, they do a lot more than just guide students. Uh, we have some new staff at the Fowler this year due to a retirement of um, the long-loved Mrs. Fuchs. Um, and the, the guidance counselor, recent, one of the new guidance counselors recently just completely helped solve a social conflict my daughter was having. Now, I'm, I'm going to guess most people wouldn't think that that's what the guidance counselor does, but that's what they do. And so when you have a student population um, and we're making a hyper-focus on social-emotional <laughs> health, that's what your guidance counselors are doing. So you're not helping yourself in your goals if you're not keeping your guidance counselors. Um, I'd also want to talk about the fourth grade uh, class sizes. Uh, when I look at this graph uh, that was provided, someone else had just talked about, um, what I noticed about it is that things are rated, but it doesn't say how they're interrelated. And so I'm going to guess, not being a teacher, that it's pretty hard to do classroom management when your class size is too large. And if you can't manage your class, then you can't really see the students if they're visible learning and you can't really make teacher evaluations and provide good feedback. Now I know my, my daughter all the way back in kindergarten, she was really being lost in the classroom and the teacher had no idea. You know why? Because my daughter didn't make any trouble. So she just sat there, she's just you know, stimming or doodling on her desk. I went in and observed because I wanted to see what was going on with her because we were having so many problems, particularly at home, not so much in the classroom, although it did finally make it there. Uh, and, and I saw what I saw when I was able to share that with the teacher who is busy with all her other, you know, I don't know how many students were there, 17, 18, 19. Then she was able to start pay, paying attention to my daughter not really participating in the class. So there is the element of, you know, your squeaky wheels are going to get the oil. The kids who, who behave in a way that's noticeable are going to get their needs met a lot more than students who are not being loud about where they're struggling. So I think that's a really important thing to think about when you're talking about the difference between 19 students and 24 students. Five st added students is a lot of added students from the range of 19. If you were talking 15 to 19, maybe it's not as um, huge, but 19 to 24 is a lot. Um, the other thing I wanted to add is uh, you guys have all mentioned, which I think is really great, that you want to know what your community says, what are, what are the priorities of the community. And from what I've heard from the last two school committee meetings is your community is telling you we want smaller class sizes. And so it's up to you guys to pay attention to that and see what you can do to have that happen. Um, one of the things I noticed in the changes with the Maynard High School with some of the classes that are not running, 11 out of the 21, or 11 out of 20, I can't remember, around half or more than half are of the arts. And I think that that is a big red flag uh, for where we're going. Uh, I think the other thing that I've heard about what our community wants very strongly is that we want our arts and our specials and that they're critical part of the general education curriculum for our students. Um, as far as the, the teachers that are being let go, I confess I don't really understand union stuff. But I do really feel like um, a lot of the conversation has been around, on union, around union contract. And I think that the unions are being a little bit unfairly blamed. 
that they, this is a much more complicated situation. Um, and, and to just label something, a, you know, a union contract or a contract compliance issue is really a very misleading statement to the rest of us who are not privy to all the intricacies of the discussions and comments. And I would caution you to cease doing that and find another way to explain some of the issues that are happening and, and not just say, well, it's a, we're trying to be, you know, um, fidelity to the contract. Um, again, I'm not a teacher, I'm not part of the teachers union, and I'm not where you guys are, but what I heard really loudly is that teachers are more than willing to go the extra mile and agree to go to the extra mile for our students, because that's what they do. That's what they've trained to do their whole lives, and that's what they do. So I hear that, and I say there had to have been a better way to go about this than you know, decimate a whole bunch of things and lay off a whole bunch of people and make the whole town completely upset, rather than is there, was there a more better, more better, that's one of my favorite ones. <laughs> was there a better, more systemic way of doing that so that the cuts and the changes weren't so dramatic all at one time. And that's really what I'm interested in, is longevity and retention. And it's very clear to me that we do not have a plan for retention in the long term. And so we run from one fire of the budget year to next year to the fire of the budget year, and we're constantly operating year by year. And it's really not helping the students in the long run, because we lose good teachers, then we have to hire them back. Well, this, this grade's too large, so we need to hire a teacher, but next year, the grade's smaller, so we're gonna let that teacher go. I just don't see that as being a long-term long plan. If I was a teacher, and I saw sort of the yo-yo effect in Maynard, I wouldn't wanna work here as a teacher, unless I went right into a seniority position that you know, I wasn't gonna be a low man on the totem pole. So I think that that is something to look at in the planning when you guys are looking at next year and beyond. We need to have a better plan for retaining really good teachers. Uh, one of the things um, some of you may know, Jessica O'Toole and I um, are very active parents in the community. We come to a lot of school committee meetings. Uh, we have the privilege um, through the CPAC of meeting with Bob and uh, the Director of Student Services, Jill Green, once a month. So we're very fluent in a lot of this stuff and may have a little bit more in-depth information than the average parent. And we recently just sent you um, a letter uh, about how we're, we made a proposal that we have all these teachers, our, our community is saying we want smaller class sizes, that's the most important thing to us. Um, so we made a, a proposal, which I know that you're not prepared to talk about tonight, but I just wanted to mention it publicly so that other people know that this has been brought up and I know you guys are gonna address it later. But our proposal was to look at eliminating the two outstanding positions for team chairs for special education. And in our proposal, we you know, labeled a lot of reasons why we think that would be um, something to consider for this year so that we keep class sizes smaller and we keep our specials and we focus more on the students than administration. Um, and then finally, <laughs> um, finally, I think one of the things um, that has come to the forefront I'm a big picture thinker. I, I, I don't know a lot about the weeds, so I can't go down there. But I, as a big picture, I think it's really important if you're serving the community and if uh, and not a lot of people attend school committee meetings, which they don't because they're every two weeks and it's time consuming and we all have our things. And I really appreciate that you guys take the time to commit to this and I know you all work really hard and you spend a lot of time on what you do. I think to gather more input from the community, perhaps you should be doing, or, or uh, considering, not I don't want to should you, but think about maybe doing some type of annual survey about what are the priorities of the community, what are the things that are most important to the people that live in Maynard. One of the things, you know, there, the, with Spanish immersion, either you love it or you hate it, there's no in between. I'm a little in between because I could care less, but on the other hand, other people, you know, are really, really, really like it. But I think in any of these things, um, any, any of the specials or extracurriculars or whether we have AP or not AP or do we only have two art classes versus 12 art classes, I think those are the things that you would really benefit from hearing from the community on a regular basis from the parents because what I thought five years ago when my kids weren't anywhere near high school is very different than what I think now. So 
what I might have said back then was different than what I would say now. And so I thought maybe that would be something you guys can think about for, for next year and for the future. That's a great idea. Thank you. Thank you. Jennifer. And, and one second, yeah, sure. I just wanted to respond to, I, I appreciate what was said, what Jennifer said about in terms of retention and a long-term plan. And as we've dealt with some of the challenges this year, one of the reasons when we, when we talked about that MO, the MOAs, um, so, you know, teachers do, through any contract, um, usually have a set number of preps that they can teach. And so to do that from a sort of year-to-year -year basis, when we're depending upon the goodwill of a couple of people, it's, it's hard to think about, we're trying to think about sustainability in terms of a long-term vision, because we don't want to find ourselves in a situation where every year we're having to go through a year like this one, where we're trying to make things more fair at the high school. So I just want to say that we, we thought about, you know, whether we, we could have made exceptions to go forward to next year, but then we'd have this, we might very well have the same problem going forward. So that is one of the things we're trying to think about is there might be a year where it's really difficult, but we're trying to create structures and put things in place that will make things a little bit better going forward. Or at least I can say that I know that's what, I shouldn't say take credit for that, but I know that that's what Bob and Jennifer have been working really hard at doing. And Jen, sorry, Ann, I know you're waiting patiently. Um, <laughs> Jen, your letter that you sent, I, you're right, we're not ready to talk about it, but we're having some internal discussion. And as a special educator in another district, I've worked under both of the systems that you clearly outlined in the letter. And Jessica, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that there's, there's positives to both of those. And I think that's the kind of outside of the box thinking that we really appreciate from the citizens because we don't sit up here and pretend to know all of the answers to the questions. You know, we look at the information that's given to us and we try to make the best possible decision for everyone. Um, but I was very appreciative of your letter and I was also appreciative of several other emails that I got from other members of the community with very thoughtful suggestions. So that's the type of thing that we're really looking for in this public forum. Like, we wanna hear your concerns, we wanna hear your vision for the future, but also, come to us with those suggestions as well because you may come to us with a suggestion that solves a really complex problem because sometimes if you're part of the problem you can't be part of the solution because you just can't see it so thank you for that sorry Ann, your turn okay. um, I just want to share something with all of you and with members of the audience um, about something that I put together a couple weeks ago, um, the Green Meadow PTO came to me and said, Anne, you're really crafty. Can you help us come up with some idea to give to the teachers for Teacher Appreciation Week at Green Meadow? At Green Meadow? And what they did is, um, about a month ago, children were asked to write down what they liked about the teachers and staff at Green Meadow and what was special to them. And so I was given a folder with all these little handwritten slips of paper that I had to sort of put together and figure out how to make this into a gift, um, which I did. And it was presented last week to the teachers at Green Meadow. And I just want to read the comments that the kids wrote and what was on this gift. And it really, I think, will make you guys, as well as everyone, feel good about our school um, in no particular order for helping me to want to learn more, for helping me to have a great and successful year, for being kind, for making learning fun, for inspiring a love of learning, for being thoughtful, for all of the wonderful things that you do, for being the best teachers in the world, for being amazingly patient, for keeping our school safe, for making Green Meadow a nice place to be, for making learning meaningful, for being loving, for being caring, for being wonderful. Green Meadow teachers rock for making me feel like I always want to come to school, for always being there with love and support, for being respectful and inspirational role models. So as I was making this, I had like tears running down my face because I was thinking of my three kids and the teachers. I've gotten to know 11 teachers over the last six years and every one of them has made a difference in my life and in my children's life. And I know I speak for a lot of the parents in Maynard who feel the same way. So I just wanted to share that as a very positive, I mean, we all know that everyone loves them, but these are from the mouth of babes, so. Thank you. Hi, Lydia. Hi. Um, I 
just wanted to, um, I know that you've all received invites to the second grade art show. I would just like to extend that personally. Susan and I um, have been working really hard to assemble all the artwork. And I would just ask that when you're there, keep in mind that she spent um, Tuesday night at the school late, hanging the art, getting it ready. It was her birthday. Tonight, she stayed late, worked on the art. It's her daughter's birthday. Um, the boards that we use to mount the pictures on ahead of time so that all we have to do is mount the boards onto the wall rather than stick each picture up individually. Those she wanted to buy with her own money because she wanted the display to be professional looking. She is very dedicated. There are so many projects where she gets really excited about it and she's like, but I don't have money in the budget to do this. And she will spend her own money on materials so the kids can do things. Like last year, the third graders did steampunk bugs. And that was like one of the best projects. And so many of the second graders last year were disappointed this year that they didn't get to do steampunk bugs. But it's because she couldn't afford to buy more parts for them to do that project. And when you're looking at the Sonia Delaney circles that are gonna be part of the art show, and you see the metallic watercolors that they used, and they're fabulous. She bought those with her own money as well because the kids really, really loved them. And when she ran out of the first batch that she bought with her budget money, <coughs> she went and replaced them with, with more so that the kids could still use those for the ongoing projects. So she's dedicated, and, and even if you can't keep her at a full-time position, just keep in mind that these are the teachers that we're gonna lose because we're cutting these positions back to point eight. And that's all, thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Nancy O'Rourke, and I graduated from Maynard High myself, and I have a daughter at the University of Illinois. She graduated three years ago. Um, I have, believe it or not, one in fourth grade, and I have one in second grade. Sorry, I took a second there. So I, I've seen all aspects of this school system. Um, I do have to point out, every single college tour you go on, they talk about how small their classes are and the benefits of their college and why you should choose their college. And they take you into these little tiny rooms that fit no more than 20 students. And they say, we do this because we know this is the best way to learn. So if that's what all of the colleges are touting, I don't know how we could say our elementary school should be bigger. It doesn't make sense. Um, the other thing I have to talk about is cutting the guidance counselor at Fowler. This school is miserable for these kids. <coughs> these are the people that catch them. And if, if you miss it, you don't know what's gonna happen. So that position is so important. And I, I, I'm a budget person myself, so I get cutting, but I think that position, we could lose a kid from cutting that position. So really, really think about that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Well, I want to thank everyone sincerely for their comments. Um, you truly are part of the process. Um, it's been a very good night. Um, I'm glad we had a really good turnout. Um, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to the school committee to begin deliberations um, on some of the decisions, uh, the tough decisions that we have to make tonight. Um, so during that time, we won't take any questions, just so we can sort of have a, a process here. Um, but I, I welcome you all to stay. Um, you've invested a lot of time as well. so. Uh, so with that, I'll turn it over to the school committee. Um, we've got the tally list in front of us. We've heard uh, from a lot of great folks. We've heard from staff, from parents, um, from a lot of the high school kids, uh, folks on behalf of the Green Meadow kids. Um, we've all heard from folks in the community contacting us by email or in the, at the coffee shop or you know just about everywhere. Um, 
So I'd say at least, at the very least, I feel confident that we have heard a lot, and I feel really good that we're not making a decision in a vacuum. Um, so I'll open up to you folks to get us started. There's no easy decisions. No, that's for sure. I mean, keeping a, a rough count of everybody who's contributed both tonight and over the course of the last meeting uh, at the end of April, it's a pretty even split. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can just frame it, though, that we have the additional staff required, which is 339000 mm -hmm. We have the current reductions required in order to comply with the contract and make all these schedule changes that we've been talking about a lot. To, to balance the budget, yeah. And that's 294000 so roughly there's about a $45,000 difference. So in past years when we've had hundreds of thousands of dollars to make up, you were talking about cutting a lot of things. Mm -hmm. This year we're talking about needing about $45,000 extra in order just to balance what's listed here. Um, and so there's the current reductions that you could consider, but I know we've made recommendations the administration, the, the, the community have made recommendations to you. Um, so I think I, I just wanted to frame that yep. we're very close to having a balanced budget right. if we do these things. And granted, there's people that are saying that we shouldn't use contract as uh, mm -hmm. the contractual obligations as a concern, but contract law is the oldest law. We have to use that as a concern. We already do have an MOA in place right now regarding the schedule. We have to solve the problem going into next year. Mm -hmm. It's not like it's an if or. It's not like we can write more MOUs that are gonna solve the problem. We can write MOUs that are gonna make it better and provide options, more options for kids, and we talked about that, and we are, you know, we'll see where that goes. But right now, um, you, know, you have the additional staff required, the current reduction required, and we're very close. It's about $45,000. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's really the issue at hand here. Um, and the other thing is we do have staff listed and who, you know, through, again, the contractual obligation, received layoff letters um, because we had to have the options because technically we don't have a budget until the town approves it. We ha and the way the contract works, you have to lay people off just in case. <laughs> so, um, you know, I have, a, I have a question sort of sure. about the, uh, the process of how a school works in terms of guidance. Because um, that's the one that we have not had, in my opinion, a lot of pushback on, and, and that's not the right term, I'm just lacking a better term, um, until this evening. And, and I certainly respect people bringing it up tonight as well. So in terms of serving the students, does guidance fall under Director of Pupil Services or yeah. only under the principal? Like how do we, you know, how does that person's workload get divided up? I guess is a. So, um, for counselors, it's under the Director of Pupil Services, and then the And can you just give me a rundown of each building and what we have in each building for guidance and adjustment? So sometimes psychologists will help with some of the more severe needs. There's other staff around. Right.
Thank you, Jill. <clears throat> and could we, I also just want to understand compared, what is the um, comparison that shows that we are higher in that regard compared to? We had looked at data to <clears throat> similar sized districts that have, usually they have less staff, guidance staff than we do. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what we looked at. Um, so I'm happy to throw ideas out there to get the conversation going. Um, oh, of course, please. So for, I know that Dr. Girardi said that the $45,000 figure, is that in addition to all the cuts on the table? We have to make all the cuts yeah. on the table. Yeah. The oh, current reductions required have to happen okay. because of the contractual obligations, trying to solve scheduling problems at multiple schools. Those have to happen. So is the, but it, with the those, number, all you need is $45,000 so more. So that's the number we need to make up. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Just Roughly. Okay. And, and then on the tally sheet, if you look um, down numbers 35, 6, and 7, that's really where our, probably our choices are in front of us for tonight. After everything is said and done and we finally um, understand everything presented to us, that's why I added the line numbers this time so we yeah. could all discuss it more easily. Um, but that's what's in front of us right now is 35, 6, and 7. Um, and obviously anything else anybody wants to bring up, but that's just okay. in terms of the numbers and the balancing. Um, I, would just, I would just say I'm probably not going to personally refer to the $45,000 number just because I know that, um, and I think we did mean to mention this uh, during the meeting, and I don't want to get in trouble by mentioning it, but I know that we were just notified today of another out-of-district placement that's going to be happening. Okay. Um, and we know that that can be um, an unexpected hit on the budget. So I just want to make good decisions tonight of the best we can do. Um, but well, I'm always right hesitant that, that right. we just found that out. And this is, you know, this is sort of how it happens. Um, and I hopefully, um, that, so that's just something else I have in the back of my mind as far as the budget always sort of being on an, an unfortunate rolling process. Um, but we were just notified about that one a couple hours ago. So, and when I meant to mention it, I just forgot. So, um, so other comments? I, I'm happy to throw things out there just to facilitate conversation and, and solution making. Uh, but. I don't want to necessarily lead the way either, so. Well, I mean, I guess I just want to mention just off the bat that I feel like it's a difficult decision to try to prioritize given that we are hearing from the community that every single thing that we're looking at cutting is important. Mm -hmm. sure. So no matter what we choose, it's not a great choice. Um, <coughs> so I just want to lay that out there for everyone that um, I was hoping that by the end of this, we'd have clarity and we'd all be able to say, yes, this is the thing we need the least. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't feel like I have that. And I think that um, that makes it, a, it's just a harder decision. And I just want to put that out there as far as um, I, I need to do that before I can move on to making that decision. Sure. I mean, I, I want to chime in just with saying I do hear the concerns about class size mm -hmm. more generally and that I think we need to enter the next budget year with that being a priority. Mm -hmm. With that being said, I wonder when you look at the class size numbers, um, you know, in the lower grades, for, of the three things that are on our possible reduction list, if we were to eliminate a section of second grade, then we might be able to keep. We, could, we wouldn't have to reduce fourth grade, right? We could add a section to change yeah. those class sizes. You know, it's funny that you mentioned that. So um, the, the incoming fourth grade class creeping up to 23.75 is the number I'm most uncomfortable with that we've discussed throughout everything. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't necessarily know any of the kids or any of the families, but I've certainly heard that from people. Um, so whether they're at our meetings or sending an email or things like that, um, Certainly we've had the leadership team um, and teachers have concerns about that being a high number. And while we can't necessarily, this budget cycle for certain, take everyone down to 16 to 18, and we've, we were certainly committed to having that discussion next year, I think that we could maintain at the second grade level by sticking with the plan to reduce second grade and then what I would propose is that we <clears throat> maintain five sections plus the immersion in the fourth grade. So we'd be, the fourth grade would have six sections. 
So I think what. So I don't know the procedural. You're, you well, I think what you're trying to say is that. Uh, uh, let me restate it. <coughs> we looked at we, the reason why we put the second grade reduction on there was because most of the class sizes at Green Meadow are between 19 and 20 something. What we found out through this process in hearing parents was our, when we looked at fourth grade, we heard about the third grade going up to the fourth grade, and we looked at the fourth grade numbers. They're actually going, they're, we weren't planning on reducing anything, but because of that class size and the number of staff there, it's going to be 23.75. Mm -hmm. So one of the options you could do is say, we're not going to reduce second grade, but we should shift it to fourth grade, mm -hmm. and then everything, every class would have enough student to staff ratio where they would all be in the low 20s. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what we're trying to say, what you're trying to say is, should we not even consider eliminating second grade and shift it to fourth grade to address the concerns we've heard? And uh, it, so. Yeah, it, and I mean, that's fine. You know, I don't know the correct terminology to use yeah. for sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, next year's second grade class, putting the immersion class aside, drops from 104 to 85. Um, and that's the one, when you're in a budget cycle where you are looking for wiggle room and you don't want to look at it like that, but you're stuck with it, um, that's where I see a small amount of wiggle room. Um, but I am still fully committed to looking at class size in general when we can actually have enough time to impl find and implement a solution. We certainly aren't in that spot in the middle of May, in my opinion. And but so that's, m so my suggestion in, in terms of moving the conversation going is, is to shift sec the second grade, um, to fourth grade. Does that, that doesn't solve the problem though still, right, of the $45,000 no. reduction? No. No, this is, yeah. that's more of a one for one, right? That's just addressing the parental concerns about class size and the fact that when Dawn was doing it at the last meeting, realized 23.75 is kind of high and hearing the parents rather than continue to, so it's kind of taking off one of your options as opposed to deciding on which option. Mm -hmm. um, I think it takes one off, which makes it even harder because then you have two other very difficult discussions. But, um, but we have heard loud and clear that the third grade going into fourth grade could be an issue, and we look at the numbers, and it could be, and it is higher than the rest, and all the rest are very similar. And this would bring that back down to very similar. So this isn't a solution. This is actually just a consideration to take something off the table. Well, and also I think it, it gets us at least in some direction, right, right <laughs> of this does. difficult decision. And it, start, and it speaks to, at least for the moment, class size, because it allows us to, um, and, and some, a lot of concern we've heard about, which I would like us to be able to find ways to be responsive to individual grades and even individual classrooms as best we can. And I'm sure that everyone's doing that every day in every way they can. And this is a way I see that we could do that by being able to say, we keep hearing that this Third grade going to fourth grade is feisty. Is that, is that thing? Spirited, <laughs> sure, we decided we're using. Really <laughs> so, you haven't seen so, spirited till our kids get to third grade. Let me tell you, Bethel and I have got some spirited. We can all arm wrestle and see who wins in the grade. Anyway, so I think that um, that that allows to be able to kind of address a few of those concerns at least right now before we're able to look at that in a longer term. But that then leaves us with some other difficult choices. But. It, does yeah. seem like it would address some Well, importance. picking up that conversational thread then, if, if we're reacting as a group to the conversation around class size, and we're proposing sort of for all intents and purposes <coughs> removing the second grade teacher reduction from the conversation and shifting that to a fourth grade position, then that brings us to the other two choices that we really have, which is the Fowler guidance position or the literacy coach at Green Meadow either of which is less than ideal. However, um, if I'm gonna put my special educator hat on for a moment and talk about social emotional well-being, I, I feel like in the short term, you know, if, if we're looking at ways that we can grow or recover or whatever it may be in the upcoming budget years, <clears throat> I, I would feel better not worrying about the social, social and emotional well-being of our students. Mm -hmm. Right, but the, you do you make a good point if we if we do the switch from the second grade to fourth grade mm -hmm. hopefully maybe you can offset some of that with a smaller class size since that's what we keep hearing a lot about that's a good point 
Now, I know a lot of people talked about the guidance, but maybe with a smaller class size, especially in <coughs> fourth grade. Um, yeah, no, I, th I, I think those are both great points. Um, you know, in terms of the Fowler guidance, it, one of the reasons I asked Jill for some clarification is, you know, I wonder if there is, so th well, I don't think t tonight much we will say this to Bob. But I think this is one where I could say, I could get around saying to Bob, you know, can you look at the, the letter from CPAC, talk with Jill, and see if we can find a way to maintain the guidance. And I don't know that, so I'm not gonna make a motion that says we must maintain this, because I just don't know that it's fiscally possible, but I'm very moved by the arguments, of course. Um, and if there's any sort of, if there's any way to look at how that's provided through the director of people services and the superintendent in terms of CPAC's recent suggestions, and I know we haven't talked about them. There's no secrets in there. There's just, it came in very last minute. Um, they have some suggestions based on their intimate knowledge of the special education process um, about eliminating some higher end positions and looking at how we provide services. So, so to be fair to the new incoming person who will be taking Jill's place, I don't wanna, especially without someone to guide us, make any major suggestions on special education. But if there's a way to look at that, I, you know, I would certainly encourage it. And that's just one way we could go. We could certainly go other ways tonight. Um, but that's, that's just one thing. It's, um, I'm, you know, I'm sort of wrestling between, did we hear more? Well, a lot of parents at the last meeting got up and spoke very eloquently and passionately also about the need for Title I. Yeah. And not always because their kid was in Title I. I think a lot of parents, and, and I had some at Green Meadow today, say that they really hope we can maintain Title I because they understand that when those kids are getting that benefit, it benefits their kid by default because everyone's learning. Um, and well, that really moves me too, so. And I do think we did hear here, maybe not specifically Title I, but really that the job, we really need to make sure kids are able to read. Yes. Right? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I feel like that's a start. We're all, we, and so <laughs> that, that would seem that in line with that, that Title I is, is, um, a very important way to support that learning mm -hmm. um, for an important group that for whom they they get service there. If I could just bring it back to the research that we've cited, if you look at Hattie's work in terms of response and intervention, that's what we're talking about <coughs> with the Title One program, right? Yeah. Okay. So, and that that's very high on the list yeah, in terms yeah, of impact. Yeah, and the other thing I would add is if you could make a decision tonight and just pick one and let the other two, I can then bring those people back from layoff which is really important. We've heard that from mm -hmm. the parents too, so that's, I'm hoping we'll have a decision that if we just pick one thing, we basically have a balanced budget. It's not perfect, not everybody's gonna be happy with what's on there. But if we, that means two people will know that they have a job tomorrow. Absolutely. I'll, right. I'll be sending letters out saying, by the way, we had a, a meeting and we, and these are important, all three of them are really important. I wanna let yeah, somebody I, know. I, I wanna send a please don't leave letter. Yeah, yeah. So it, it would really be great if we could make, it, as difficult as the decision is, because all three are very important. Mm -hmm. If we make one, that means two people are gonna get good news tomorrow. Right. right. And if we, if we just you know, talk about a, like a partial equity, if we're talking about helping out Fowler by moving up a second grade to a fourth grade, that helps out Fowler, but takes away from Green Meadow. Right. From an equity standpoint, if you take away Title I from Green Meadow, and now you're essentially taking two things away from Green Meadow. It's funny, I thought of the same thing. Oh, that's we've a good heard point. a lot yeah. about class size <laughs> being important, and I know we've heard a lot about guidance being very important too, but hopefully like you said, with maybe with some of the suggestions coming in with the special education, maybe right. there's some way we can make that work. Right. So to me, and I know not all things are equal, but trying to look at it from somewhat of an equity standpoint, it would make sense that if we're going to agree to shift the second grade to fourth grade and we're taken away from green metal, then we would want to keep Title I at Green Meadows, so we're not taking two things from I find, I always do that too. I, I sort of think of like, how can we, because there's never a good answer on any no. of this. So you really look for really small ways to think about it that, and I was sort of thinking about the same thing. So, you know, in terms of the high school, I'm glad that we're gonna be maintaining a ton of the classes the kids, not a ton, but with our word, but a lot of the classes the kids need. Um, and we're gonna be able to do that. So I'm happy that we've addressed the year long problem at the high school. Um, in terms of if we can get the, the fourth grade class size down, um, the incoming fourth grade, you know, that I think is, I think that's something that responds to a lot of what we're hearing. Um, you know, I'd also like to just discuss if we could rescind the literacy coach as well, 
And is there any way to sort of make up that difference under this building substitutes um, on item number 12? We haven't really talked about that very much. So yeah. I don't know if there's anything, if there's any sort of wiggle room in there. Well, so we do have reserve funds mm -hmm. and those are used as one-time payments when something's not working mm -hmm. or when you need them, like a boiler breaks down or you need extra sub building substitutes. And we did talk about those as a contractual issue as well because there's an obligation for us to provide enough substitutes during the, you know, so there's a contractual obligation that we should be trying to provide enough substitutes for the teachers. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so what's happened is that we've had a need to have building substitutes. In every district I've ever worked in, anybody who's been a teacher can never get enough subs, right? We all should agree on that. Yeah. But so one of the things that I brought in was the idea of a building sub, but we couldn't afford it this year, so we didn't have building subs. Mm -hmm. But guess what? We couldn't afford not to have it either, so now we have six building subs, but we can't afford it. We're using our reserve funds to pay for it. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of a, a have to have. I mean, we could re consider reducing it in half maybe, but I don't, I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. I, I see that what happens is every year there's a need. Right. And so what happens is then Pete says, well, you know, we'll have to dip into the reserve fund. I hope the boilers don't break down. Thank goodness this year we had a good year with the boilers, right, Pete? So we didn't have to worry about the boilers, but we had to worry about all these subs that we didn't plan on paying for. Right. So that's why that's there. And we were just looking at the numbers today, Jennifer and I, of the numbers of subs that matches that. So. Mm -hmm. May I ask a question? I wanted to go back to the, the guidance counselor issue for a second. I know that we, Jill had said, we have two guidance counselors at Fowler, two at the high school. What are, I, will you remind me of enrollment numbers? So what is Fowler student enrollment? What's the high school student enrollment? Are they similar that we have? The They're same all either counselors? plus or minus 500. So okay. I think Green is a little higher. Uh, Fowler, because the eighth grade move up, is a little lower in the high school, somewhere in the middle, but I could be wrong. They're roughly around 500, plus or I, minus. I just was curious, so in terms of the reduction, why the reduction at Fowler as opposed to the high school if they're similar? Because right now the staffing's similar, so if the right. enrollment, I understand the Fowler's. So in a lot of the school systems, usually there's more guidance at the higher levels because there are also college applicants. It's in addition to comprehensive <coughs> guidance and the social emotional piece, the guidance counselors are also responsible for writing <laughs> letters to get students uh, on students' behalf and getting all that sort of stuff organized. So the guidance needs are the most heavy at the high school. That's a reality. And that's why always, in every school district, you'll see the guide staff at the high school are more than at the middle school, and the middle school is more than at the elementary school. And, and just in a recent year, didn't we reshape the guidance department at the high school? I, I want to say there was an FTE that was affected, maybe two years ago? Actually, we've, you know, in the past, we've actually, for teacher need, we've actually had teachers who have requested partial schedules as guidance. So we, even though we say we had two guidance, Technically, we've really had, I'm sorry, yeah, even though we, we listed it for you that we've had one st uh, student adjustment counselor and two guidance counselors, technically, I believe one guidance counselor had requested that they work a point eight schedule one year. One year they requested a point six schedule. So technically, we really haven't had two full-time guidance counselors. Just um, two people. Just, there are two people there, but they're not full-time. And so going into next year, that might be something I can explore with the union and the staff too, is it, if that person chooses to work full-time, then we, you know, they, they obviously get the full-time, but if they wanted to work part-time, it has happened in the past. So to say that we've had two full guidance counselors at Fowler is not correct, actually. The more I'm thinking about it, several years in a row, we've had a staff member who has requested, for family reasons, to work less than a full schedule. Mm -hmm. And so they're not working a full schedule. So that might be an area where if we did look at guidance, I could work with the guidance staff to see if maybe voluntarily some of them would prefer uh, to work less than a full schedule so that maybe we could make something work. So I'll just throw that out there, that it technically <coughs> it just dawned on me. We don't have two full guidance counselors. We have 1.8. And I'd still just... Uh, is that 1.8 or was it 1.6? 1.8. Right now, yeah, this year, we had a staff member who requested less than a full schedule in the guidance department. It's 8 or 9, yeah. Yeah, it's 1.8 or 1.9. So technically, we don't have two, a full 2.0. Gotcha. So it just, it just dawned on me that, that, you know, there's two people, but it's not a full two positions. I got you. Somebody make a motion. Uh, let's see. So is the motion 
there's no motion yet. Right, but if we were to make a motion. Guys speak in the microphone. Yeah. <laughs> so are, is it one separate motion or two separate motions? I'm going to do them separately just so we have it very clear. Okay. I think so. Okay. Well, you go for it. Go All right, so I'd say to start with, to I make a motion to take the second grade position at Green Meadow and transfer that to a fourth grade general education classroom at Fowler. I'll second. Discussion? All in favor? All right. Do you need anything more specific to take next steps? Nope. So on that particular I will issue? make sure that the staff members are given the appropriate letters so we can get them all set for next year. Okay. Perfect. Um, so, you know, I'm a little bit, you know, hazy on the math, um, but I really would like to, you know, I would like to make a motion to do the same for the literacy coach. Um, and then I'll make a motion to rescind the letter um, on the literacy coach as well, um, knowing that in the motion when we say discussion, that's when we discuss it. So I'm making that motion to move it forward. Second. Discussion. Yeah, like I stated earlier, I think that makes sense from an equity standpoint try and keep some kind of equity here. What do you guys think? Part of my discussion was sort of, you know, how am I going to sort of explain what I think about the math? Um, and I really would like to reiterate my, my request to look at CPAC's letter and recommendations heading into the start of the school year, um, trying, if possible, to add some more guidance. And maybe that's a half-time position at Fowler, um, but I'd like to leave that with the staff to sort of see if they can come up with a creative solution for the guidance. So my my motion to rescind the letter to the GM literacy coach is because I'm hoping for line item 36, we can try to find a creative solution. Um, so in effect, if all of those things were to work out, we've solved at least the three problems on this piece of paper. Not to say we don't have work to do for next year, um, and I'm. I think all of us are committed to looking at what are the right size class sizes in Maynard. Um, you know, I want to find out how are other communities having 21 kids and having success? You know, do we need literally just fewer kids in each class or are we not doing the right types of professional development? And I don't want to go down a road of, of all the what could be's, um, but I want to have a really great discussion about that next year. I just don't see us solving a problem of that magnitude no. before. No. If anything, we're making more work for ourselves for next year, but that's okay. Yeah, no, I'm totally so. up for that. Because so. <laughs> next year was looking too, so boring. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, so, yeah, so my motion is to rescind the letter uh, to the literacy coach at Green Meadow. Uh, I, would, I would say that, um, that I, I think that it would be great if we can um, – Discuss what you were discussing. Can I do that now? Yeah, because we're in we're in dis we're, we're in discussion. So please take full advantage. I'm not really sure I'm in the right discussion. Um, so I would say that um, things like looking at the the creative solutions CPAC, maybe we can drop guidance down. I, it just seems like guidance is very meaningful as well. So we obviously and there's been we've heard the ways that it's been very meaningful and hormones and such things. Um, and so I just think if we can preserve um, part of that position and look at other ways to shift, um, if that's even dropping down one sub from the building, if we, there's some way to yep. pull something from there, and, and then maybe if that, that's a less of a hit if you have to go into the reserves, uh, potentially, right? Mm -hmm. And then the CPAC, um, that was, it was very, th and I'm really sorry that we don't have that to share with people, um, but it's just, it looked like there could be potential for um, for really um, some possibilities for being able to preserve some things now that seem very important to the community. Mm -hmm. And if we have the people from special education, representing special education, telling us that that might be a, a, a good um, shift for them and that they're okay with it, we should really look at that. And if that's a possibility to be able to look at that for this year as a creative solution, I think that's mm -hmm. would be a good. So I would go with what you're saying then. More discussion? Otherwise, I'll call a vote on my motion. All in favor? All right. All right. More? We're good for now? I think, yeah, I think okay. we've got a balanced budget as of right now. We're okay. going to look for some creative solutions to try and bring back at least some part of guidance. 
Um, and we're going to be talking about Spanish immersion. We're going to be talking about CPAC's recommendation at the next meeting. Yep. And um, I would like to just say one thing. I think that we should <coughs> make it clear that um, we we would like to talk to you about if we could add something back. If some of this, like there, it's very clear that people care about the arts, that they're concerned about the specials. Absolutely. So um, I think it was a fair point that we should. If we're talking about, we've heard feedback that people would like to have. Um, part of the reason you saw on there, we've heard from families in regular classroom. We would like to receive benefit from language two early on. So that's why that was in there. But it's a fair point to also look at: could we restore other things um, that we? And um, it's unfortunate the way it works, and people feel like ping pong balls sometimes. It really is. Um, but I would like to make sure that we, we have that in the conversation as well. That's a great point. All right. Sorry to interrupt you, Bob. Go That's ahead. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, members, comments, questions? All right. Motion to adjourn? So moved. All in favor? All right. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.